Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for coming today. Uh, when Dr. Zizana Zvobodova, sorry, Zvobodova, okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, uh, invited me uh, to visit Prague as a speaker at your university, I was very surprised and delighted. Uh, surprised because apart from the students that I've taught over the years, I hadn't supposed that anyone out there had noticed my book or anything, <laughs> apart from my mom. But uh, I was delighted by Susanna's invitation because very often, as many of you probably feel too, when we care about things that seem to others not relevant or important, and when we ourselves feel those things are of the utmost importance, we can begin to feel quite isolated and excluded in our passions and thoughts, or at the very least, disconnected from others. So it's refreshing to find small enclaves of like-minded people like you with whom you know, we can discuss and who share the same deep matters of heart and mind. So I think one of the difficulties of uh, philosophy and philosophizing is the loneliness that can accompany it, accompany it. Even though I'm a very strong believer following Aristotle that all human beings desire to know, and therefore that all of us in some fundamental way are able and even driven by a part of our being towards wondering and philosophizing, nevertheless something about the way that we live and the way that we cultivate our propensities renders philosophizing largely irrelevant. Uh, to the majority of people. So when we philosophize, rather than this being an activity that inspires broad societal interests or that draws citizens together in communal acknowledgement of wisdom as our highest good, the activity of philosophizing is rather more marginalized and uh, private or at least subtle, understated, and therefore Thank you very much. Welcome. Easily overlooked. When we express interest in philosophizing as a valuable element of education, when we most uh, we most often find ourselves affirming its worth and considering its practices all by ourselves. Philosophy seems also to put us at odds with the authorities and the powers that be, as well as with the zeitgeist or the new and popular ways of doing things and thinking about things that are being lauded all around us as truth. This is one subtle way in which those who philosophize often suffer a bit more, or at least differently, than other people, for we're made to stand alone and apart, and we hesitate from joining with or embracing broader areas of societal acceptance. Our concerns seem irrelevant, ridiculous, and even contrary to common sense. Uh, the spirit of philosophy is grossly misunderstood, and we, along with philosophy, can be blamed by those who misunderstand the activity of philosophizing. So here I am most vividly reminded of Nietzsche's recurrent lamentation about the loneliness of his own experiences philosophizing. Nietzsche's writings always strike me as beautiful because, well, it's so heartfelt and comedic, but it's also tragic. I say heartfelt because his passionate words to me are like cries from the wilderness about the importance of wisdom seeking. In his writings, Nietzsche calls out to other souls scattered across space and time. He seeks like-minded individuals and companions of the spirit, friends, if you will, with whom he might establish a kind of dispersed or diasporic community. However, Nietzsche laments in the geneal genealogy of morals that as yet, quote, I have found no friend. Nietzsche, I think, dealt with his own feelings of debility and isolation through laughter and comedy uh, for him and maybe also for many of you in the audience today. Philosophizing must always remain in some fundamental way an isolating and lonely affair. Anyway, all of this is an explanation of why I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's joyful and it fills, me, it fills a person with uh, gratitude to know that they're indeed not alone. Uh, and more subtle pass and, and uh, they're not alone in their deeper and more subtle passions and interests. And that in some way, mostly unbeknownst to them, they do share in a kind of community of spirit. Even that uh, such a community of spirit exists is remarkable to me. Whenever 
a chance upon manifestations of it. Back in Canada, I have felt and continue to feel a great empathetic relation with Nietzsche in his articulation of the loneliness and the set-apartness he encounters in the activity of philosophizing. Philosophy really does seem largely irrelevant in the eyes of many of my fellow educators. Moreover, my penchant philosophy has um, made it difficult for me to fit in anywhere as a teacher, and the practice of philosophy is certainly scoffed at by most of our educational institutions back home. So naturally, having been put in contact with a group of people like you, uh, in such a faraway place, for me anyway, as Prague, uh, where, for whatever reason, people seem to share an interest in philosophy and a passion to know, to ask uh, questions and to seek out wisdom in your daily life, by, um, you know, in your teaching practices, to ask these kinds of questions, uh, find people like you who are attracted by the prospect of practicing ways to live that's in that spirit more fully, even thinking excitedly of teaching as a way of life for the genuine pursuit of wisdom, this is something that makes me very happy and hopeful. So thank you. Now, uh, I thought I might tell you a little bit about myself and you know how these topics um, became important for me over the years. I, I was born and raised in Canada, but in rural southern Ontario especially, uh, I grew up um, in the countryside as an only child. During my childhood, I spent long stretches of time playing and imagining all by myself, sometimes in the quiet stillness of the house, other times out in the fields or wandering in the woods. As a child, I learned to be comfortable with silence, maybe far more than I am now, in fact. Uh, I felt the natural world around me as a kind of companion presence uh, with which I might commune, or at least with which I might stand in relation. Right. On my grandfather's farm, as well as on each of my two uncles' farms, and later on our own farm through inheritance, I felt a deep affinity with the land itself, uh, not as though it were an object, you know, simply uh, owned and mastered, but as a living and breathing entity steeped in personal and family history, identity and responsibility. Hi. Come on, excuse me. That's okay. Over the years, I walked and crawled every inch of that soil many, many times. And the land, and the crops, and the sun, and the earth, and the sky and clouds, all these elements I felt in personal relation with as a boy, right? Caring for this patch of earth with my family, my cousins, neighbors, childhood friends, and surrounding communities shaped me in subtle ways. I left the farm many years ago, but to this day, I'm sure that these experiences of working and sweating under the sun with others in cooperative effort and conversation were what sowed the seeds for my own understanding of how a classroom community is ideally configured. The crucible of toil and beauty is also uh, the place where I learned the joys of open, inquisitive conversation. Not so much in the school, where topics are contrived or stipulated by the teacher, but out in the open air bent over a tomato, <laughs> or a melon, or a strawberry patch. On the farm, uh, you're in a place where your hours are not your hours, in one sense. As a farm worker, you're, after all, a wage earner, right? So your body is in metaphoric chains, but your mind is free, right? This freedom to think, and to wonder, to talk when you want to talk, or else to drive your thinking on ahead into an open field and silently, in a vast solitude, to explore and to wonder, to hash things out, or to simply practice emptying and quieting the mind, cut loose from all other concerns. This is delightful. That's why I learned the delight of philosophy, I think. The farm laborer may find genuine leisure or scholarly amidst those uh, long, hot days of toil and sweat. He enjoys the exquisite peace and quiet and solitude, freedom and wide open spaces of nature, immersion, and the dense smells of vegetation, growth and decay, wind and dust. All this quiet symphony of being is played out around us amidst the, wind, the world's natural diurnal rhythms. So there's much gratitude and sweetness to be found in the simple sweat and labors of the body, even a drink of water 
is so much more beautiful in the 90 degree heat and dense humidity. Of course, it's also true that this environment or atmosphere for leisure rising does not guarantee every young man or woman will notice these sublime things, take them up or harbor them in their heart and mind, let alone practice with them, the philosophic energies that uh, they're associated with. Indeed, although these childhood experiences serve to soften my spirit and to open my heart in a yearning receptivity, most farmers I know are too hard-boiled to have gone this way. Even among my childhood friends and family, I seem to have been a rare breed, but still it's undeniable, for me at least, that this interplay with the world, with being, or what is, has created a certain kind of consciousness and awareness and a hunger in both my heart and my mind that steered me towards philosophizing and that cultivated my desires for philosophic pursuits later in life. And as a teacher, I'm thankful never to have lost my farming roots. Farmers must always plan for what's ahead. We try our best to anticipate adversities and to distinguish the things that might be under our control from those which are beyond our manipulations but are instead governed by chance. Farming offers all sorts of opportunities to affirm the statement, I will be done. On our dry land farm, for instance, not having the benefit of irrigation systems or even a nearby creek for water and despite all our careful planning and stewardship, we relied purely on the unforgiving powers of the sun and the rain for sustenance and so that our labors might bear fruit. Expressing thy will be done, finding some manner of deep attunement to the ways that things ineluctably turn out, especially a joyful acceptance of what is. Perhaps what Nietzsche referred to as amor fati. It's never been my strong suit but it's something that I have long sought to be able to do. And this troublesome disjunction I experience between myself, my will, my understanding, on the one hand, and the unfolding of the universe around me, on the other hand, was perhaps first brought to my attention on the farm. Where I often encounter, as Robbie Burns once wrote, uh, the best laid pans of mice and men being off and leave. Right? Looking back, I think that the quiet experience of natural beauty in my childhood and early adulthood were most conducive to making the spirit of philosophy and philosophizing important to me. Just now, I'm remembering one early morning during my 20s, sitting alone at the steering wheel of our old Massey Harris Farmall tractor. <laughs> there I was, driving out once again into the fields in order to cultivate the crops. To this day, some 20 years later, I remember the sun rising across the field, you know, like Homer's rosy finger dawn. And I, I recall pink and gold light, right? Just like actually this morning on the plane, uh, cutting through the crisp morning air like a knife, I can still picture all the myriad dew drops glistening and sparkling like so many radiant diamonds perched row upon row in the leaves of tomato eggplant pepper plants, and among the coarse vines of ripening cantaloupe or watermelons. Sitting high atop my tractor perch, my eyes and my spirit could feast those mornings upon the rich, voluptuous fields of fruit. Feelings of grace and transcendence poured up from within me. Likewise, as I drove past strong, proud stalks of corn, watching them as they reached and strained, miraculously rising from the silent earth, climbing skyward. Everything was full of life and vitality and all was saying yes to what is. In those quiet moments of solitude, everything, all at once around me, embodied the Nietzschean affirmation of fate that in my heart of hearts, I wanted so badly myself to be able to do. If <laughs> corn can do it, why can't I do it? Why, why am not I as good as a piece of corn, you know? At such opportune times, and in other fleeting moments like these throughout my life, I found myself in similar rare situations, intuiting and seeking, uh, seeking after the sublime. I locate, uh, thank you, I locate the ground for my own philosophic yearnings in these self-same early morning experiences. Upon this land is where I was granted initiation and early original awareness of an entry point for the pursuit of the kind of spiritual attunement that I sought as my heart's deep desire. 
so many years ago as that budding philosopher in my grandfather's fields. Steeped in sweat, that land delivered me uh, some inkling of how to find myself. Its beauty called out a siren song for me, beckoning me to sing my own part in the symphony of yes saying. Such lived early dawn experiences in a tomato patch awakened for me a subtler dawn of the spirit, or dawn of the heart. These quiet experiences, scattered and disparate as they are, have served to call me into community of being and beauty that, in some exciting and suggestive way, didn't end with a gratitude at the sight of green, gold, green golden corn, or the feel of crisp country air, or the spectacle of mul multitudinous crystalline dewdrops glistening and shining in the morning light. Nope. All this symphonic beauty pulled at me. And it continues to pull at me long afterwards. Even to this day, those originary experiences beckon me to ask myself, where does all this lead? What does all this beauty point towards? Where is the source? What is this tugging and pulling within me that draws me outside of myself, that pulls also at the corn? causing it to reach up as it does. Why is everything so good and beautiful when I'm truly able to see? Why does everything sing like this when I'm truly able to listen? And such questions as these remain for me the only questions that never dry up or run stale. Indeed, these are the persistent inquiries that serve to awaken me when my spirit falls into slumber. And when I go full of sloth, and pride, anger, resentment, when I fall into bouts of taking for granted as one prone to squander his riches, or simply when my mind crusts over. Only these kinds of questions seem to be able to arouse me from my own staleness. They alone provide me with a way back towards the true originary things. They help me to recall that first sacred pull and they act as an inner compass for me that somehow finds magnetic north again and again amidst all the other stronger attractions and distractions. Rediscovering and reconnecting with this pull alone can shake me back into relation uh, with the subtler things that have always made, me, made a deep claim upon my heart and my inquisitiveness. It seems to me that different people find different ways of connecting with or reawakening or cultivating these sorts of animations. For me, the farm was my first sacred place as a child, but there have been a multitude of others since then. For many of us here today, it might not be a place so much as an activity like fishing or you know, hunting, canoeing, and camping. Or it might also be a place of worship like a church or a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, or a sweat lodge. I guess you don't have sweat lodges over here in Europe. Well, uh, <laughs> we, we, we might likewise reestablish or awaken sublime animations uh, through art or music when we're embracing our loved ones, making overdue amends with them, holding hands or exchanging affection with a husband or a wife, or watching children play. I'd surmise that our own personal reawakenings, moreover, occur just as often not only in our times of comfort or amidst our simple happinesses, indeed, being comfortable might even hinder our awareness, right, of subtle things. Rather, attunement to original experiences may descend upon us, most especially during our dark times of suffering or sorrow. But in any case, it seems to me, at least in my experience, that we all need to find space, one that's perhaps more inward than outward, in which our spirits can be inhabited with the receptivity necessary to send us on our own pursuit of wisdom. This is the jump-off point for my own forays into authorship about the nature of wisdom and uh, you know wisdom's pursuit in education. So I remember more recollections. I remember when I was a boy, I was maybe about 15 years of age, and I can remember laying in my bed at night staring up at the ceiling and thinking to myself very seriously with great sincerity if only like I actually remember this if only I, I, I just work hard to learn these deep things 
If I just study hard, I was a weird kid. And if I study right now, start right now, and if I look into these things and into these books, let me seek out all the best writers and the most thoughtful people about these quiet things. If I learn from the men called philosophers and also from these poets and musicians who ignite something inside of me, and if I'm careful to read and to understand the words of the spiritual teachers who have come before to help me, then I should one day, very soon, maybe the year 2000 even, be wise. I'll know everything I need to know to be able to be happy. All these problems and confusions that I have right now as a kid, all these ways that I fail, all these confusions and questions and not knowing what to do, I'll figure it all out with their help. I bet if I work hard and don't give up, I'll be able to figure everything out by the time I'm 30. <laughs> that's exactly what I thought. So that's pretty naive, right? But I remember vividly this moment, lying in my bed and thinking these optimistic thoughts. Of course, now, at the age of 46, what an utter disappointment I, I would be to my younger self. If as a boy, I might have met my older self today. For here I am now, having followed in some fashion at least that same program of work my boy had heard pledged for myself that night laying in my bed, right? In the darkness of my bedroom. Here I am, one who has long taken to heart the beautiful ideal of institutional education. Not as a professional job accrediting machine or a glorified trade school, but rather as a cathedral of learning. Like in Europe, in Europe, you guys get education. Uh, where liberal arts uh, uh, means the attempt to free the self from its own private and egotistical ends in pursuit of truth and what is for its own sake. And perhaps like some of you, I've put aside so many other things that have to do with being successful and secure in the world. All this in order to devote myself to my naive Childhood search. Any of you who are liberal arts people with a philosophic bent know firsthand how many years of income each of us has been willing to relinquish in order that we might be left unmolested in the pursuit of our deepest passions and perhaps, uh, hopefully, offer some assistance in seeking to know ourselves. To this day, and because my desires to know such useless, elusive things, I remain a kind of economic basket case. That is to say, although I've had many jobs over the years, I, along with my children, remain mostly reliant upon my wife and her more sensible life choices to keep our family solvent. Like a sponge, I've siphoned off others in the name of pursuing higher learning through a bunch of degrees and libraries full of books concerned with unfurling the world's beautiful and insightful traditions and religion and philosophy. But through it all, am I any wiser? Am I any more filled with insight or understanding? Am I any happier? Have I, quote, you know, figured it all out like my younger self anticipated? Not really. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, in fact, as far as I can tell, indeed, in all truth, I feel no wiser now than when I was a boy asking questions about what it means to be wise. So there's comedy here somewhere, right? Now, as a teacher and an educator, I must suffer through long, painful commencement addresses at the end of each school year. Typically, the principal at our high school or a school board trustee or some other noteworthy makes a comment like, graduates of such and such year, as you move on from this day to become tomorrow's leaders in your respective fields of endeavor, let me share my wisdom with you. Wisdom. That's what they actually say again and again. Without much variation, people who speak to us as our leaders stand before all the rest of us calling themselves wise, making statements about their wisdom, and how they wish to teach us something from their wise standpoint. And that's always rattled me, because uh, I know only too well that craving after wisdom and seeking to know myself, I myself am not wise. Further I know, as does anyone who ever read Plato, that Socrates, the veritable prototype for pursuing wisdom as a way of life, likewise was aware that he lacked wisdom, or at least that the wisdom he did possess, namely the knowledge of his own ignorance, was a small and paltry wisdom indeed. 
Additionally, I know from Pythagoras that, quote, only the God is wise. And I also know, as do any of you who study the Eastern masters, that ancient sages like Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu always appear not wise, but foolish in the eyes of men, and that they spoke of themselves as fools. I know, too, that the great Islamic scholar Idris Shah spoke of, uh, quote, unquote, the wisdom of the idiots, here referring to the great masters and teachers in his own holy tradition. So, too, did the venerable master San Hua, uh, or, sorry, Xuan Hua, um, in the Chan Buddhist tradition, speak of himself as a semblance of stupidity. So, why is it that folks who we take to be most wise, right, never claim wisdom for themselves, whereas the successful accomplished elites who are put in charge of things are always touting their so-called wisdom? As a backdrop, or contrast to all these examples of people claiming not to be wise, we have... Um, those ancient writers, orators, and teachers who were only too willing to parade and to flaunt their wisdom before the rest of us, proposing it as a programmatic solution to all our worries and cares. These men were known back then as sophists, those wandering, self-proclaimed wise men who, for a fee, promised fathers to teach their sons to be tomorrow's movers and shakers, successful in business, law, politics, or whatever other intrigues and pursuits they might take up. Curious how the wisdom of all these teachers, when their claims to being wise, were interrogated by men like Socrates or Augustine, Augustine who referred to them as the wreckers, how their self-proclaimed wisdom turned out to be not wisdom at all, but only a kind of ignorance masquerading as knowledge. So it's my experience, at least, that things haven't really changed much in this regard. Nowadays, the sophists lead educational movements, and they're paid six-figure salaries for their troubles. They develop four-year plans for the rest of us in education. They devise new models for inquiry, school, redesign, student assessment, professional development, technological platforms for individualized learning, and school accountability structures. They speak about how students today are, quote-unquote, different than ever before, and how we must transform both ourselves and our professional practices to adapt what they call the ever-accelerating rapid-paced changes in education and learning. They most commonly have little patience for uh, conserving any of the earlier traditions of learning, those older ways that have often proven to many of us their value through the long years of our experience. Out with the old and in with the new, they say. And they admonish us, don't be a fixed mindset person. Be a, anybody heard that term, fixed mindset? Be a growth mindset person, right? Uh, embrace change, meaning embrace their changes and their plans including the unquestioned assumptions underlying their plans. They also trumpet the notion that everything they're doing is aligned with uh, the findings of hard statistic-driven studies and research-based education. Their overarching plans for all of us are apparently drawn upon and cite studies that have the seal of academic legitimacy. And these studies can be used with impunity to dismiss our lived experiences as the actual classroom teachers who are immersed in the everyday slog and business of teaching in the schools themselves. Moreover, their claims about education they call knowledge, whereas our skepticism and reluctance to embrace the envisioned changes and the reluctance we harbor based on our own intimate experiences as teachers, they refuse to speak of as based in knowledge of facts. Rather, our observations as teachers are most often relegated to the realm of opinion as anecdote. Admittedly, I've been naive in my own childish pursuit of knowledge. In some ways, my early optimistic belief as a boy that if only I studied hard enough, worked hard enough, and learned broadly enough, that I would become wise. Isn't that dissimilar from the views of those people in charge of education and teacher training today, who similarly believe that if only teachers work, study, learn hard enough, and 
broadly enough, if only they themselves are schooled in the various areas of professional competency required of them, then they will, under our wise management, be able to lead students towards ever increasing levels of achievement and success. The idea is quite familiar to all of us, really. Learn about as many diverse areas of educational investigation. Take a broad range of courses from experts and specialists in literacy, numeracy, English language arts, learning disabilities. The, the, the list is long, right? Then you'll be wise. However, and as like many of you have already experienced in life, wisdom eludes us. Even when we've familiarized ourselves with all these various components of education, whatever wisdom is, it isn't the simple agglomeration of these disparate yet related things. In fact, it seems to be the case that wisdom isn't something that any of us can gain through instruction. Moreover, just being smart and working hard to develop our knowledge and our know-how won't bring us wisdom either. Intelligence and know-how are of ambiguous value in relation to wisdom. Robert Sternberg, the psychologist, has written about this. Here's a big quote from him. <clears throat> he says, human intelligence has, to some extent, brought the world to the brink. Intelligence has brought us many good things, but also brought us nuclear weapons that have the power to destroy the world many times over, as well as the addictive designer drugs that are destroying the lives of millions of people, young and old, around the world. Human intelligence, combined with creativity and practical intelligence, may have brought us the disaster of the World Trade Center that took place on September 11th. The plan was creative in its own way. It was analytically brilliant, evading the defenses of the nation. It was politically shrewd, inflicting maximum damage for the number of people who were involved. But the plan was not, for whatever else it may have been, wise. And the people who hatched it weren't wise either. It may take wisdom to help us find a way out of a trap of our own making. Sternberg's observations here invite us to question just what we think we are doing and achieving through all of our hard efforts as teachers. In my part of the world, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, the big buzzword in education nowadays is outcome-based schooling, or more generally, teaching for the demonstration of competencies. Our provincial overlords list these as innovation, uh, or sorry, I'm missing a whole bunch of them here. They, oh yeah, critical thinking, problem solving, managing information, creativity and innovation, communication, collaboration, cultural global citizenship, as well as personal growth and well-being. So it's easy enough to, say, to see how each one of these eight elements falls prey to Sternberg's critique. How any and all of them, all the items in the government's laundry list, when cultivated without concern for wisdom's pursuit, simply brings about more pain and suffering in the world. So the greatest challenge, come on in, the greatest challenge of high education, in my view, is to find a way to bring conscious, to consciousness some understanding of what wisdom is of why wisdom is so valuable and hopefully a variety of ways to entice us, all of us, both as teachers and students, towards pursuing wisdom in as much as we are able. And there are a great many hurdles in our way, both personal and societal or structural. The personal hurdles are straightforward enough. Each of us is attracted to a multitude of other goods which we value inordinately as compared to wisdom. That highest good, without which no other goods can rightly be enjoyed. Indeed, there's so many good things, so many beautiful sights, so many truths for us to explore and seek after. We find ourselves caught in all kinds of confusions and enticements about these things. We're led this way and that way by our desires. Uh, we often seek goods that are in reality quite a bit less good than we suppose them to be. Likewise, we're prone to turn our noses up, right? At other goods that are, in fact, much better than we suppose them to be. This is our ignorance and our folly. 
without being able to judge well about the variety of good things that attract us and being at the mercy of our desires and our ignorance in this regard, we rank and order things, good and beautiful things, improperly. Our minds can't see clearly. We find our will disordered. Time and time again, when the truth unfolds before us, we find ourselves fools. Let's read Shakespeare. Right? Philosophy can help us in our plight. As the love of wisdom, philosophy would have us begin with each of our particular loves. She would have us start by hearkening, or she would have us start by hearkening us towards recollection, and thereby to consider each flash of the beautiful that we espy, not stopping there, being satiated or seeking gratification, as though this incident or sight were the whole of the good or the beautiful, but rather challenging us as wisdom's bold lovers to inquire and to take up our respective visions of beauty towards higher forms, even to their source or ground in beauty itself. Now, of course, some of you will recognize that this so-called ladder of love imagery, that we're present, uh, it's what we're presented with by Diatima, in Plato's Symposium. But it's important for us to remember that the philosophic movement of the soul in pursuit of wisdom isn't simply an ascent. It is simultaneously a descent. Same time. Diotima's ladder goes up and down. It goes both ways. As Heraclitus long ago said, the way up and the way down are one and the same. By this he meant that philosophy isn't simply a going up or a taking up of whatever good or beautiful thing we see towards its source. It is, as Plato once wrote about it, the art of dying and of being dead. It is therefore a going down into death. It is a dying away to the individual psychomental states and ego flux that we most often associate with our own personal identity or who we are, but which is not indeed our true nature. Plato's art of dying is one and the same with Aristotle's statement that philosophy is immortalization. It is effectively the daily practice of dying away to the mortal elements of human being so that what is immortal might come out clear. Clearly enough, the innumerable personal reasons and enticements towards other things than philosophy present considerable hurdles to teachers who would endeavor to lead their students in the practice of philosophizing. While there are many personal impediments to philosophizing, here, in our nucleation of philosophy as the art of dying, we can begin to see significant societal or structural barriers as well. Not just personal, but societal or structural ones. For starters, philosophy cannot simply be all those things we've been told it is in our universities, in popular consciousness, or ordinary parlance. That is to say, philosophy isn't simply metacognition or critical thinking, nor is it simply conceptual analysis, nor is it a method of inquiry, or a kind of work, or the equivalent of a science, nor is philosophy a teachable subject. Philosophy, rather, in its lost meaning, and it's been written about by wonderful scholars um, like Pierre Hadot, is a way of life. It's a way of life, grounded in a kind of spiritual yearning, or tension, toward the ground of being. Philosophy is therefore a spiritual as well as an intellectual practice. However, as soon as we come to see that it is of this character, we can easily recognize just how foreign it is to schooling, and to what the vast majority of people either want or expect out of an education. Put starkly, Whereas parents, students, administrators, teachers, and governments seek an education for success, prosperity, right? Philosophy is a kind of spiritual devotion to a search that renders these goals questionable and of dubious value, to say the least. Indeed, once uh, 
what Joseph Kiefer has called the cultic character of philosophy and philosophizing is exposed to the light of day, we can begin to see just how in inhospitable modern educational sentiment and understanding are towards philosophizing. Naturally enough, we can also begin to see why the love of wisdom is so readily persecuted and forsaken. The love of wisdom has little place in our educational considerations. What is most especially lacking in our current day educational understanding is any enticement towards wisdom. And here I'm supposing that wisdom is not what the principal, the school board trustee or the esteemed orator says during commencement speeches. But what precisely is wisdom anyway? Well, among the ancient Greeks, wisdom or sophia was understood as that highest good, Aristotle, by which all other goods are properly measured. It's the knowledge of the ground of goodness in which all that is good necessarily participates. But as the highest form of knowledge, wisdom is quite unlike all the other sorts of knowing with which we are most familiar. For wisdom is also a goddess, Sophia. Being divine, Sophia transcends all our ordinary ideas about knowledge. She is, a, in a fundamental sense, beyond every distinction we might make. She is beyond all particular or finite aspects of being we might espy. Beyond all individual things, thoughts, feelings, as well as all temporality, change, division. Wisdom is quite beyond our grasp or comprehension strictly as mortal beings who know by sensing and by the processes of discursive reason. This is why Pythagoras uh, said only the God is wise. Such ancient insights tell us that to the extent we're merely mortal, wisdom must always remain beyond us. However, to the extent that we're able to die to our mortal selves, and for Plato, philosophy is pre precisely this art of dying, to this same extent, we might also share in a more than mortal, divine sort of knowing or immortalization. Indeed, immortalization is one of Aristotle's most provocative and illuminating ways of describing the nature of wisdom's pursuit in his Nicomachean Ethics. Linking education to wisdom seeking in this fashion creates serious difficulties for us, however. Part of the problem is that one who loves or pursues wisdom, the philosophos, right, is always in some way asking questions and inquiring into what is beyond our ordinary subject object knowing. Beyond the simply scientific and the measurable. Beyond all the observational analysis and judgments uh, we're apt to make uh, with varying degrees of accuracy about particular instances of things in the world. For this reason, Aristotle refers to philosophy as that science which, quote, studies being qua being. Uh, wisdom's pursuit involves a kind of contemplative seeing. The word there is theoria. That's not content to know any single aspect of things. Or even to know a vast multitude of aspects of things. One who pursues wisdom is rather intent upon knowing, as Joseph Pieper points out, the totality of things. He calls this pursuit, quote, reflection on reality as such. The love of wisdom is therefore perhaps best characterized as the desire to engage in the contemplation or theoria of all of reality, which culminates in a seeing of the all. At its ancient roots, this is the meaning of philosophy. And as teachers who are interested in wisdom's pursuit, it's important to point out that genuine philosophy or philosophizing can begin anywhere. It may arise in an inquiry, uh, in any inquiry whatsoever, where human beings desire to know, and where the desire stretches out in openness towards the totality or the ground of being. As Plato tells us in his Theotetus, philosophy most especially begins in wonder and perplexity. 
It begins with the recognition of our own ignorance, with coming to know that we don't know. In this way, philosophy is a kind of loving, intellectual, and spiritual activity, born of openness through the recognition of our own ignorance. Part of the problem we face as educators who would entice our students towards loving wisdom is that we nowadays lack any language uh, that's broadly accepted for speaking about the sort of thinking that is involved in wisdom's pursuit. I'll we'll have a little marker, hey? I'm going to love you. Ah, you're a good guy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we don't have a language um, that's broadly accepted for speaking about the different sorts of thinking that's involved in wisdom's pursuit. Ancient peoples, by contrast, could handily name this sort of thinking that aims at wisdom. The Greeks, for instance, had two words to differentiate these different sorts of thinking. This word, the anoia. And this word, oasis. Very important little words. Can you see that? Did I make that too small? Yeah. Okay. I thought uh, we might investigate these two words for a bit today as we consider the nature of wisdom seeking in relation to education. The anoia generally names the sort of cognitive activities outlined in Benjamin Bloom's uh, taxonomy of educational ob objectives. Ben Bloom, that guy. You guys, education, you know him. The analytic thinking occurs where beginning with the first principles or axioms of any of the diverse sciences uh, and arts studied in school, uh, we inquire or radiosinate using... Uh, using them inductively or deductively. It's in the realm of dianoetic thought that students gather and comprehend facts about things, that they analyze, pull things apart, they synthesize, bring them together, they critique, they evaluate. It's here that uh, they develop their thinking from the simple to the complex. That they innovate ideas and that they apply and demonstrate their knowledge and understanding. And it's in this realm the annoyance that we as teachers administer our formative and summative assessments according to the objectives and the outcomes mandated by our educational superiors, as these align with the specific, you know, specifics of our own disciplines. The cultivation and evaluation of dianoetic thought takes up much of our time. It seems like this is mostly what we do. Oh, you're a good man. Look at this. I got two colors. Soon I'll have a rainbow. <laughs> right? So it takes up most of our time, consumes most of our efforts. So whereas Dianoia involves the discovery and use of axioms and hypothesis, hypotheses without testing them dialectically or taking them up, and the word for taking something up, take up, is uh, anhyresis. Um, towards their ultimate measure, it's through noesis, by contrast, that we aspire to know the highest things. And it's this form of thinking that orders the soul, or the psyche. This, actually, this, this goes here. Uh, noesis, often translated in English as intellection. Intellection. Uh, names the kind of cognition whereby we don't simply discover the archi or axiomata of our respective fields of inquiry, applying them laterally into the realm of multiplicity occupied by our disciplinary studies. Rather, noetic thinking takes up and erases all such axioms and principles, as well as all hypotheses towards that first principle, uh, the archi. Um, or ground, which is itself the measure of all else. Put another way, noesis is not content to ask even an infinite multitude of questions about this or that quality or aspect of being in this or that area of inquiry, but it seeks to know being as such. 
In the theoretical realm, the Greeks called such knowledge by the name of Sophia. In practical matters aimed at achieving uh, the good in human affairs, such knowledge was called phronesis. You've heard those words before? Yeah. Okay. Whereas, I don't want to talk in jargon. It's like This isn't jargon, but I, I don't want to make it sound like it's jargon. I'm hoping it's a, a language that when you learn it, you can talk with some, it opens your consciousness, not shuts it down or confuses it. Where Diano, whereas dianoetic rationality is the manner in which we as human beings come to know the world around us through chains of reasoning, intellection, intellection is a way of knowing that transcends our strictly mortal nature. For unlike radio, sorry, that's like a Latin. This is Greek. This is Latin. Uh, unlike radio, the Latin term for reasoning from point to point to point, akin to Greek dianoia, intelligentia, there's a good Latin. Hey, let's learn some Latin and Greek today. Latin. Uh, the Latin equivalent of noesis, roughly, knows not by the work of reasoning, but all at once in the understanding, or intellectus, which is described by Boethius as uh, the union of seer with what is seen by one stroke of the mind. It's like seeing all at once. Understanding. Union of you with whatever it is that you're trying to understand. Unlike Dianoia, where uh, knowing transpires objectively as a subject standing over against its object, in noetic cognition, categories of subject-object do not apply. Rather, in the act of contemplative seeing, or theoria, theoria, the distance between knower and what is known disappears entirely as each becomes the other in a unity. These two aspects of uh, mind, Greek dianoia and noesis, or in Latin, radio and in and uh, intelligentia are likewise recognized and named in the Zen tradition, where dianoia is akin to thought, uh, which is nen nian. This is Zen. Um, and noesis to no thought, or wu nian. Uh, no thought. No thought, I'll put it here, and then thought over here. Like that. And here, we should stress that there is no anti-intellectual implication being made. For in neither the Eastern nor the Western uh, wisdom-seeking traditions is the dianoetic faculty spurned. Right? This, isn't, this is not like they, we don't like this. No. Certainly, we couldn't get along in the world without the ability to handle things objectively. As tool-making masters of nature, right? As scientists, technicians, artisans, we must be able to manipulate the world as object. Indeed, human beings attain a degree of understanding of the world and themselves through radio, dianoia, or uh, nen nyan. And it would be well nigh impossible for any of us to come to wonder about the world and our experiences at all, and hence to take things up philosophically without the capacity for the annoyance. As D.T. Suzuki puts the matter, it is through your seeing, hearing, and thinking that you enter upon the path. Zen Master Dogen long ago stated Suzuki's point similarly. He says, uh, quote, It's through the discriminating mind that we are awakened to the Bodhi mind. Without the discriminating mind, we can't awaken the Bodhi mind. This doesn't mean, however, that the discriminating mind is the same as the Bodhi mind. Rather, it's by using the discriminating mind that we awaken the Bodhi mind. Unquote. However, while affirming the value of the noetic cognition, or nen nien here, Suzuki goes on to note that it's through seeing, hearing, and thinking that you're prevented from entering. In other words, 
the machinations of reason are insufficient on their own to attain to the ultimate object, or rather non-object, of cognition. As Meister Eckhart writes, desire extends further than anything that can be grasped by knowledge. Noetic insight is therefore only attainable through the infusion of a certain kind of love or desire that propels the will beyond all specific instances and ideas towards the ground which transcends all discursiveness, all subject, object, no one. Here we should be careful to emphasize once again that discursiveness is not per se irreconcilable with noetic thesis. These, these two things are not irreconcilable. Noetic in their direction, sorry, uh, Socratic inquiry is clearly discursive in character, right? Back and forth, ch chains of reasoning. Uh, and the Madhyamaka dialectics of Nagarjuna, uh, they're discursive. Um, emptiness theory, that stuff. Noetic in their direction, they too require the rigor and discipline cultivated by dianoetic exercises up and down the Bloomian taxonomy. The important thing is to, under, uh, to understand is that on its own, expertise in such machinations leads nowhere with regard to wisdom. So anyway, the larger point I've been trying to make in today's discussion about uh, the Anoia and Noesis um, as different ways of thinking is to suggest that something is amiss in the way that we nowadays think about thinking, learning, and becoming educated. Something very precious has been forgotten, right? Right here. Um, and discarded. We no longer even seem to acknowledge noesis as a legitimate form of intellectual activity. Whereas in ancient times, or even in more recent times, say among the Plains people of you know North America or the Native people, right? Uh, this is a big thing now back in Canada is uh, indigenous ways of knowing, uh, Aboriginal ways of knowing. In either case, the noetic capacities or capabilities of human beings were once regarded with the highest esteem, whereas now they're not even recognized. But all is not lost, and perhaps there might be a way of reawakening educational elites to the importance of wisdom and a wisdom seeking, if they can be persuaded to regard other ways of knowing as legitimate. Maybe someday you guys will become educational elites, maybe, and uh, change it, fix it for the rest of us. I have suggested that we start on this road of recovery by looking back at the world's beautiful ancient traditions of learning. I've long felt that it is there that we might begin to rediscover something about ourselves in relation to wisdom. Now, there's one final thing I want to say about wisdom seeking in schools, and that's in regards to the value of seeking wisdom or sophia in schools. As, as, as we've already seen, there are significant reasons why the pursuit of wisdom or sophia will always be spurned by our modern institutions and by people in general. Sophia's pursuit as a spiritual practice will appear cultic, otherworldly, or religious to many people. And this, in my experience, can create a certain amount of hostility towards philosophizing. But beside that, philosophy unsettles people. It questions, its questions threaten their sense of direction or purpose, underlying their assumptions about life as well as their confidence in the ends they've set for themselves, or maybe their parents set for them, right? Either personally or societally. These are perhaps some of the main reasons why philosophy has been overlooked by our educational system today. And why instead, when people even bother to talk about wisdom in education, they most often speak not of sophia, uh, but phronesis, otherwise known as prudence. Prudence or uh, practical wisdom. Practical wisdom. That's the big one. <clears throat> when I was being trained for my professional teaching degree years ago, I remember that a good number of our course readings were actually uh, assigned in the B.Ed. program, made explicit reference to 
phronesis. I don't think it's like that anymore. Well, it's definitely not like that anymore. I know that for a fact. And they, they emphasize in particular how our teacher education curriculum at the University of Calgary was concerned with cultivating phonesis. No mention at all was made of Sophia in any of the readings, as I recall. Phonesis, uh, concerned as it is with securing the common good in the thick of human affairs, especially in the here and now of decision making and judging, seems to encapsulate all the wisdom that any teacher might reasonably want to have without any of the pitfalls, much maligned navel-gazing or cultic qualities of Sophia. Similarly, when people consider the cultivation of wisdom in schools, they often do so in the context of history, civics, or social studies classrooms. So Professor Sternberg, for instance, has made a noble attempt at creating an education program entitled Teaching for Wisdom that looks to historical events through case studies and that challenges students in middle school to figure out the implications of these events. The idea is that by considering history, students will not be doomed to repeat its mistakes. They'll have cultivated some practical wisdom. So, the pursuit of prudence or phonesis as opposed to Sophia seems much more practical, much more educationally appropriate, and considerably more realistic. After all, doesn't practical wisdom or the knowledge and the ability to do what is best in any given situation that life throws at us on its own suffice for happiness? Indeed, doesn't Sophia appear quite useless by comparison? These are tough challenges. And on the surface, it makes sense. Nevertheless, I'd like to begin by pointing out that when we as teachers or teacher trainers jettison concern for Sophia on the grounds that it's useless by comparison to Phonesis, although it may seem as though we're doing so because of our commitment as teachers to doing what's best for each of our own students in any situation, in reality, we're turning our backs on the deepest and truest nature of what it means to be a teacher. For as Thomas Aquinas long ago observed, teaching at its core is a contemplative activity. Or rather, it participates in both of what Aristotle referred to as the active and the contemplative lives. That is to say, it embodies the active life inasmuch as it is the practice of loving service towards our neighbors, namely our students in the school community. But it also participates in the contemplative life, inasmuch as teaching erupts from, or is grounded in, a love for what is, and a desire to know what is. It has, at its core, the seeing of what is, and a kind of gratitude and wonder at what is. And the teacher to be good at his or her vocation must at the very least know something about what his or her subject matter is. He must, or she must, have seen at least to some extent what is in this or that field of inquiry in order to be a competent teacher about it. Indeed, the teacher seeks to share what he or she has learned or seen with others out of a love of being. He or she seeks to lead others likewise into the joys, this is the active component, right? Into the joys of this search to know what is. Come with me, right? Perhaps even finding partnerships with his or her students in the quest to know what is. This is the active component of teaching, where prudence is most important, knowing how to navigate decisions in human relationships and how to make the best choices about what to do from day to day, week to week, month to month, in the service of our students. But here, you can already see that the act of life of the teacher doesn't arise out of nothing. It's not self-sustaining. It requires nutriment, a fertile soil, out of which it might gain its sustenance. Teaching, says Thomas Aquinas, is primarily grounded in the contemplative life. And only secondarily, in the act of life. 
without the love of truth and the desire to know what is and the flashes of being that drive us in our search, what is our impetus to teach? Money? Maybe. I know what is a teacher. Money, yeah. <laughs> Fear of unemployment? I know what that's like. I mean, right? The five-year plans of our employers and their so-called wisdom? These are all reasons, but hardly the reason, right? The heart of teaching, says Thomas, is deeply rooted in the contemplative life. And the contemplative life is concerned with the pursuit of Sophia. Those of you who have read your Aristotle know that both Sophia and Phronesis are concerned with the supreme good. Or what the Greeks referred to as the Ariston. Phronesis is that excellence of soul wherein we are able in any situation to achieve the best outcomes for ourselves and others in relation to the common good, the koinon. Sophia is that excellence of soul that knows the Ariston itself. This capacity for knowing the Ariston is what ancient and medieval peoples prized most highly as our best and most beautiful of human attributes. So wonderful, in fact, that its activation in the contemplative activity involves us in something more than what is strictly mortal or human. The philosopher Eric Vogelin, I'm going to write his name up here. Do you guys know Eric Vogelin? Oh, I don't even need... That's amazing! You guys got to realize... Oh my God! Good, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Eric Vogelin. Uh, this is a quote from him. Man can eat it, the contemplative life, only insofar as he is more than man. Only insofar as something divine is really present in him. Since this divine part in the composite nature of man is the noose, or the intellect, noose, <clears throat> the life of the intellect as is divine as compared with the life of the merely human level of the practical excellences. And remember, this is what concerns those who suppose we can forsake Sophia and instead only be concerned with the acquisition of prudence, right? Vogelin continues, Hence, we must not follow the advice of those who would enjoin us to think only of human things because we are men and only of mortal things, because we are mortals. Here, Volkman could easily be speaking about these self-same educational experts we've been talking about. It's our duty to make ourselves immortal, as far as that's possible in life, by cultivating the activity of the best part in us, which may be called our better or true self. The noose is the orienting or ruling part in our soul, and it would be strange indeed Man should choose not to live the life of his own self, but that of something else. In short, whereas the point of action or praxis is in the act of life of the teacher is to attain and to assist others in the attainment of the highest end for themselves as mortal beings, the end of theoria in contemplation or contemplation, or the contemplative life that we cultivate through the practice of leisure or scholae, is Sophia. This is our supernatural end. It is an end that is not specific to human beings insofar as they are merely mortal, but rather to the extent that they participate in what is immortal or divine. The search for wisdom or Sophia among teachers is therefore not something that ought to be discarded since this is an abrogation not only of our highest nature as human beings, but also of what lies at the very core of the nature of teaching and what sustains the deep activity of the teacher. But if teaching ought to have its grounding in the contemplative life, what about the lives of students? Again, what can we say about those reformers and visionaries of education who suppose that the best thing for students is to be administered a curriculum devoted to the acquisition of practical wisdom, prudence, or phronesis? For this is the thing that will make them the best decision makers in life, and this is the thing that will prepare them best for a good life. 
Aristotle's written about this. In his Nicomachean Ethics, he warns us against instructions designed to lead youth in pursuit of phronesis. Aristotle thinks that youth, you can't teach towards this. He emphatically states that they should not be led in such studies because, quote, each man judges correctly those matters with which he's acquainted. And youth are acquainted with very little, right, due to lack of experience in living. You haven't lived enough. Moreover, to criticize a particular subject, quote, a man must have been trained in that subject, unquote. But youth have not yet received sufficient training or developed such competencies. Aristotle goes on, uh, quote, to be a, cr a good critic, you must have an all-around education, unquote. But youths are not so educated. Not yet. Hence, lacking sufficient experience of things in the world, of human affairs and politics, young people are incapable of its study. And not only that, Aristotle observes that the youth are led by their feelings so that they'll study such things to no purpose or advantage. My God, I think he's been in my uh, high school classroom and seen how rambunctious my students are. But his cautions against leading the youth in pursuit of phronesis are not just ageist. They're not like a form of discrimination against young people. For Aristotle remarks that one can be young or old in years, but still immature in character. Inasmuch as the lives of students are guided by feeling, knowledge of the practical world of human affairs and decision making for the common good is of no use any more than it is to persons of defective self-restraint, unquote. Aristotle instead advises us, or advises an education for youth aimed at the cultivation of moral virtues like moderation, courage, temperance. He thinks that's what we should be doing with kids. We see similar cautions in Plato's dialogue, Lysis, you guys read that? That's a fun one. I strongly recommend that dialogue by Plato. About friendship, if you love thinking about friendship, the dialogue. Um, about the pursuit of phronesis with children. I love this dialogue. You'll likely have noticed how uh, so many of Plato's dialogues involve youth. Or, uh, nay, anyone? Nay, anyone. It's essentially, teenagers. Plato, Socrates is always talking to teenagers. Like, most of the time, which is neat to me, because I talk to teenagers most of the time. Uh, so anyone out there who says that Plato or Socrates suppose that wisdom's pursuit is inappropriate for young people or teenagers should ask themselves why Socrates would continually engage in an activity that he himself deemed destructive or harmful to young people. But the Lysis is even more interesting to me because here... Socrates is discussing not simply with uh, Neani. Right? I'm going to use this. Is this one? Oh, it's a portal. Okay. It looked like a a permanent. Not with, but also with. Right. These are teens, and these are preteens, or you know, prepubescents. So the license is with younger kids. It's a neat dialogue. Um, they haven't yet begun to sprout facial hair or entered into puberty. Here, as in all the other dialogues uh, with youth, Plato, through Socrates, is showing us that the pursuit of wisdom as Sophia is entirely appropriate for children that children are in fact quite good at it, since they're open to wonder and perplexity in a way that most adults seem not to be. So, pursuing Sophia, Lysis can do it. The young, the young kids, the young children can do that. They still harbor the deep questions and naive inquisitive of, uh, inquisitiveness of youth um, that at a certain point gets beaten out of us and falls away as we grow older and more confident in our seemingly you know, vast understanding of the world as adults. 
And youth uh, still maintain a closer recolle- recollection of the originary experiences of things. Those experiences, like the ones I offered uh, you from my own boyhood at the, earlier in the speech. But nonetheless, although the young boys in the dialogue, their names are Lysis and Menexenus, and although they proved themselves to be wonderful companions to Socrates in the pursuit of Sophia, their lack of confidence and naivety in practical matters or worldly affairs is adorably and comedically exposed in their comments throughout the discussion. For instance, Lysis, the young boy, uh, takes it to be the case that the best of men uh, with the greatest of wisdom or intelligence ought naturally to be favored in all things. But he has no experience of the grown-up world and its fickle passions. He doesn't realize that men's vanity and their lust for power often prevent them from recognizing the value of deferring to decisions of the best man. And the childish naivety, this childish naivety is evinced most plainly in Lysus' belief that his own father will defer to him in all his business as soon as he grows more knowledgeable in household management. As soon as it becomes smarter than my dad, my dad's going to be, well, son, I guess I'm too stupid to do this. You take it. It's not going to happen. But the logic of it works for him, but he doesn't understand the practical way things actually pan out. Right? He's a young kid. Um, Lysus further supposes not extrapolating from his own family, right? That not only the people of Athens, but even the great king of Persia himself would naturally hand over his affairs to Lysus one day if he became sufficiently wise or intelligent. Not going to happen. Indeed, Socrates' own persecution and death is yet another fine, unspoken counterexample to Lysus' mistaken belief that men will defer to the best. Nonetheless, I'd like to end today's lecture with this point. Lysus is able, as are all human beings, to philosophize. Indeed, philosophizing begins with the experience of wonder and perplexity. It begins with the unsettling awareness of our ignorance, of our own deficiencies in the good, and consequently in our desire for the good. And young people, most happily, are especially good at wondering and being open to big questions about who they are and and, uh, about being. Which is why it's so good and so precious to be a teacher who wants very badly to cultivate a life in pursuit of wisdom. What better chance do we have to embark upon such a life uh, then, as Christ says, uh, tells us to become once again like little children. So that's a lot of talking on no soup. I hope it wasn't uh, too distressing. If I did that back home, everybody would be on their phones and computers and probably write nasty things about me. So. Thank you very much. It was it, it was very interesting for us. Thank you, Mr. Department. Thank you. 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 I just couldn't help thinking while I was listening that uh, some of the aspects you talked about were, in fact, uh, very unphilosophical. Uh, uh, they were more mystical than philosophical. Mm. So you were balancing between mysticism and rational philosophy, I would say. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, getting it all wrong, but those are my impressions. And um, I, um, you mentioned two things. I remember uh, you mentioned growing up on a farm, mm-hmm. and I can share the experience uh, because my parents had a cottage when I was little. Oh, yeah. To that cottage, I, I know what it's like when growing up in nature and all that. Absolutely. But that's actually not exactly a philosophical experience. And then a few times, uh, you basically sounded like a, I started theology. So you sounded like a monk talking. Mm-hmm. So all about um, spiritual experience and I'm not even going to be insulted. I'm like, well, thanks. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not insulting you. No, I know you're not. I was just playing with you. As I you said, mean. I really enjoyed your lecture. Yeah. But I just couldn't help thinking that um, uh, 
think the, some of the things you, you mentioned are, uh, are actually uh, carried out by psychologists at primary, primary schools and secondary schools. Mm -hmm. All those team building programs and um, the spiritual growth or whatever, I'm not mm -hmm. really interested in all that. Mm -hmm. But I know it's happening. And, um, well, my question is, um, um, well, first of all, uh, does philosophy, does it really, can it claim the power and uh, the, the ability, the competence really, to uh, teach us how to live nowadays? I very much doubt so. And I believe that it's not philosophy that has the power today, it will never have it again, those times are gone. And because uh, that we're talking about the world of the Greeks, and uh, when, when philosophy had that power to educate people and to uh, develop people spiritually and mm. inwardly, I think that time is gone. And um, I think that was what happened later in uh, Europe was that it was it was taken over by um, you know, religion and tradition. Yeah. And I believe that if there's a, if there's any way if there's if there is any way back to that world that we've lost the world of philosophy teaching us how to live and giving us wisdom. The only way back is through tradition and not philosophy, and for many reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, philosophy, like mysticism, in fact, has always been uh, it's always been the area of the elite and uh, a few uh, a few percent of uh, our civilization. Well, thank you. <laughs> that's the that's, that's basically if you can um, if you could um, somehow yeah. address that. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's, that's excellent. What you said. Um, I, my, I'm suffering from lack of sleep, uh, so I might miss a bunch of things. Uh, that, it's, not, um, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> I don't mind. It's just, well, well, to sum up, I was talking for too long, sorry about that. No, it was uh, good. To, to, to sum up, in my opinion, philosophy, philosophy has, cannot claim that power, cannot yeah. claim that competence to teach us how to live anymore. Right. And you also mentioned something very interesting. You, you said that Canadians are going back to Aboriginal thinking or something about that? Well, you know, that, that's, there's that, a lot of... That, that again is yet another great example of uh, something completely unphilosophical. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's again... Not, I mean, that is not philosophy. I, you know, I think that it may be that you and I have different understandings of what philosophy is. Like, um, I think that, you know, when you talked about uh, steal your more mystical than you are philosophical, and you, I think you associate philosophy with rational rationalism, and that. I, I, I don't, I don't. Um, I know you are the, you're more of the mystical side, <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I see, I see philosophy more rationally, rationally. Than yeah, I think but, you do. Yeah, I, yeah, I see yeah. that. Yeah. So we're coming at it with you and I. We're coming at it with slightly different. Well, actually, probably very different. Very. What am I saying? Slightly. Very different understandings of of what the word means. Um, and for me, it's a it, it's a spiritual practice. Which again, oh, so it sounds I, mystical, you know. And I think that's where you uh, where I can't join you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And honestly, like, uh, what do you do in university when you study philosophy? It's not what I'm taught. It's what you're taught. Right? And that's the way that we're trained to look at it. And I'm just suggesting that um, maybe there's alternate ways of reinvigorating it, rediscovering it. But when we rediscover it, what we find is genuinely philosophy. And it, it doesn't have to be Greek, but it's just that I like the Greeks because they articulate it so well and they have language that we don't have. Um, but you can, you can find it, like, it, for me it's not elite, like, one of the reasons why Dewey didn't like it is, and, and lots of people like Dewey, you say, yeah, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned like, names like Lao Tse, uh, you mentioned Zen tradition, that's always been something associated with it, not the elite, in terms of, uh, well, and all that, yeah. the but sage or something, the sages, yeah, the yeah. sage tradition, even in Christianity, by the way, has always been part of, um, uh, has always been a minority issue, really. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much for lecture. I really enjoyed it. And uh, my question is if these two types of knowledge uh, can be combined and how. Because uh, I think that this rational knowledge is uh, 
uh, where, uh, is, uh, where when you develop this knowledge, you have to be distant from, from the object of knowledge. Yes. While in the other one, you are merged yes. uh, or somehow connected. You, you have personal relationship yes. with what you are uh, discovered. And uh, I think that uh, these types of knowledge are present in any uh, original thinking, yes, because you first you need to be at at the subject, yes, uh, or with with it, and only then you uh, develop your thought about it. So, uh, uh, for, for my problem is that uh, uh, I can express myself in this rational discourse, but I cannot do it in this in this other one. How how to uh, shall I write poesies or, uh, yeah. or how, how it could be combined, these two, these two things? Well, you know, I mean, having discussions with kids about this or even student teachers about this can kind of glaze over. You guys have probably read Martin Buber, right? Martin Buber and you know the whole I thou and I it. I mean, this is not that much different in many ways from those two different ways of being in the world. like. Uh, I, it is very much the subject object way. And Buber starts his book by saying, you know, uh, it is manifold, right? And, and uh, you know, uh, I, it experience and that way of knowing the world is important, but uh, it's become everything in our consciousness. And it's, it's, it's kind of crowded out. The other I, thou way of being and understanding the world. And that's kind of like the precious contemplative core of things. And, and, and so that might be another language that we could use um, that kids can understand. Like, I mean, I've had conversations with them because in Alberta, we're so close to the Rocky Mountains and most kids in the summer, they'll go camping and talk about, you know, going, like Boober with the tree or anybody who's read Andy Dillard and Annie Dillard talks about her experience with the tree and the lights in it. You remember that? Yeah, oh my god. So, uh, but kids, kids, you know, when you talk about it, you know, you go through the woods and then you stand in a, in a, in a grove where there's these gigantic trees that are, there are trees in the, in the Rocky Mountains that are a thousand years old. Like, and maybe in Europe, you guys so often see that, like this place here, right? It's like, oh my god, I've never been in a building so old as this. This is insane for me, right? <laughs> Uh, the oldest things we have, though, in Canada are mountains and streams and living things. Is, and so they know. They know the difference between looking at a pile of lumber that, you know, you build a house with and knowing how many board feet that is and calculating how much money you can make that was once a tree. They know subject, object. But then they also know the different feeling between that and the, and the tree that they suddenly come across and it's so big that you and your whole family can't get your arms around it. It's covered in this much moss and I don't know, I think that that is the best way to get kids, you know, seeing that there's other ways, other ways of knowing. And the two things don't have to be separate, right? Like, I mean, like Hooper says, we do both all the time. But it, the danger for him, and I think the danger I'm trying to point out is just that all we seem to care about is that in philosophy, you know, this probably sounds mystical, but philosophy is this, right? That's, that's what it is. It's the art of dying. It's noesis. It's anhyresis. But my, my, my only argument is that this can be brought about by means of tradition only. It can not be taught as theory. And besides, I think that's part of... Um, what you, what, you, what, you, what you mentioned here mm. is part of any educational process as such. It comes along very naturally. So, what comes along naturally? What well, are uh, the uh, questions of? Um, I apologize. I have to go. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for a very interesting speech. And yeah. I am very glad to see you, to hear you, and also. Yes. Well, I thank you. It. Thank you very much. Ahoy, check ahoy. <laughs> <laughs> Things like striving towards uh, wisdom, uh, well, uh, things like uh, relationships between teacher and student, etc., etc., yeah. and um, uh, deep dialogue, all these basically could be part of any subject. Yeah, absolutely. They well, should be. Yeah. 
But the thing is, I mean, once you start talking about Sophia, Geronesis, and Peoria, I think you become unacceptable for not only headmasters, but yeah. students as well. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, in, this, in this book here, um, you were talking about how you need a tradition, and traditions, right, in the Middle Ages, right, Christianity, right, and, sorry. This, this here um, was my attempt as a, as a teacher in a, in a university bachelor of education mm -hmm. department to actually create a kind of a curriculum based not on, you know, I'm a Christian or I'm a Buddhist or whatever, and this is my tradition and this is how we seek after wisdom. But these are just basically experiments that students in a Bachelor of Education program can practice with from day to day. Uh, spiritual escasis, as Pierre Hadot would call it, right? Uh, Pierre Hadot, his belief in what philosophy is, isn't just the reading of texts and critical analytic work, but it's actually practices we do every day uh, that are spiritual practices. So the students, uh, they practice with these things, they experiment with these things, they journal about these things. Um, and through, say if you have students in your classroom for a semester, through the whole semester, the students map and they track their, their investigations. Mm -hmm. and, but they have to enter into, they don't just read, and objectively study, like, the thoughts of Rousseau or something, they actually try to, what, what would it happen if I actually lived that way? What would happen if I actually embodied or put that on as a way of interacting in the world? What happens? And it's like, oh my god, right? <laughs> something, that, that's, that's very difficult, or that's, that's strange. Um, so, for me, um, how do you make philosophy live? That, that's, that's interesting to me, and that's why I wrote the second book, is, is to get people thinking about philosophy as a way of life that can be practiced in pursuit of wisdom. Is it really, sorry, is it really desirable <laughs> that, we, that, 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 that we all attain wisdom? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't the world that we live in become a, basically a dysfunctional world? And I think it would. And, um, so, yeah, the economy would probably grind to a halt. Because why would we all be buying stuff at the mall? We'd probably stop buying things at the mall. It we'd, would be a disaster. Yeah, it would be the, the, the whole economy would collapse, exactly. probably. Yeah, maybe, right? I mean... And, well, and you mentioned um, some sages like Leo, etc., 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 and, et 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 and um, being on the, on the edge of madness, almost, and um, uh, or, uh, you, you, I think you use the word fools. That's used in the Bible as well. But um, I think that the, the reason why they used such paradoxical language was that true wisdom, in my opinion, is, and I, I agree with you on that, is unachievable by means of reason. Yeah. So it can only be achieved by uh, means of paradox, etc. Et mm -hmm. But do you think it's only, or I think at least, that it's only um, a few that can actually achieve that kind of state of mind? And it's mm -hmm. not even desirable. Uh, more than a few do achieve that. Well, I, don't, I, I mean, I, I, that's a good question. Like, I mean, I look at so Socrates as my prototype, mm -hmm. and Socrates never, ever, 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 ever claimed to be wise. He was always searching for it, mm -hmm. right? And so, our, what you know, counting up who I think is wise, who is it? I don't know. I don't have any clue. Like Socrates went around trying to find a wise person, and he never found anybody, and then he got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> for that, because, you know, he humiliated a bunch of people. Uh, but, you know, it, the point is searching, right? The point is searching. Uh, openness, receptivity, um, trying to unfurl your own and, 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 and realize the extent of your own ignorance and dealing with that. And that's, that's the pursuit of, that's the pursuit of wisdom. And, you know, arguably, I think you're right. What's your name? Robert, I'm sorry, Robert, like, you know, probably if people were more inclined to question their motives uh, and the things that m drive them to engage in the economy or that engage in business or engage in um, war, uh, they wouldn't do that stuff. Right? They'd be less likely. I mean, philosophy is kind of a break. That's why this other guy, 
Uh, Isocrates, I wrote a chapter in uh, both books on this fellow. Mm -hmm. But he really didn't like the, the, the Greek philosophers because he thought, you know, they, philosophers are a bunch of idiots and they're they're just gonna ruin it. They're gonna they're going to destroy yeah, and he was right, yeah. But I am not I'm not arguing that Greek philosophers were fools or that they shouldn't be trusted. All I'm saying is that Greek philosophy as it emerged for the first time, emerged in a completely different social context, They're in a completely, yes. completely different world than ours. Our world is a lot far more fragile, and there are far more, far more people involved with it. And the Greek world was pretty fragile, uh, too. Yes, it was, yes. But it didn't like, you read Nietzsche on, on the Greeks, right? right? Yes. He talks about it as, do you remember the image in, in Nietzsche, where he's talking about the Greeks? And he's, he's, uh, it's like this, I think it's like an image of a chariot, mm -hmm. and it's driving so fast over all this, this uneven ground, and the wheels are busting off of it, and the horse, and it's all coming apart. It's like, ah! It's like a scene out of, like, Belma and Louise where they go off the cliff, right? Uh, it's, it wasn't, it was, it, it was pretty fragile. It was pretty yeah, fragile. Yeah. I've, uh, yeah, I've seen that in I've right? read that image, yeah. yeah. Anyway. one of the areas where this is starting to be talked about, but I, I mean, I haven't read enough into it, but um, my sense is that the heart is in the right place with, with, um, with that movement, but they also don't have a good solid grounding in uh, philosophy, I, I think, in some ways, that tradition. I, like, I, I think maybe they're... It's natural enough too because they've been so persecuted and horrible, horrible things have happened in Canada to Native people. Things we did, like you guys, I don't know if you learned about that over here, but terrible. Um, but then they're very protective of it and so it's hard for, it's hard for people who have been just destroyed by Western culture to see any merit to Western culture. So um, one of the challenges I think in Canada is even though a lot of beautiful work is being done with indigenous ways of knowing, for at some point indigenous peoples to, and, and non-indigenous peoples to be able to dialogue. The dialogue is very on shaky ground in my experience with it, right? It's so, I, I once, oh my god, I remember being an undergrad student, this was many years ago, uh, so this is way before Truth and Reconciliation too, but I remember wandering into McMaster University and they just started up a, it wasn't called Indigenous Studies, it was called Native Studies back then, and um, the professor was at the front of the room and, and we were, she was introducing all of us to Native Studies, and she says, uh, Western tradition is anti-spiritual. West, West, Western civilization, like what you, Europe, anti-spiritual, and 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 indigenous or native things are 
spiritual, like these just crazy dichotomies. And I mean, I get why, because there was pain, right? Her people had suffered, right? Residential schools, like terrible stuff. But then after class, because I was still deciding on whether I wanted to take this course or not, I went to her and I said, you know, in one of my other classes, we were reading Black Elk Speaks. Did you read that? Beautiful, beautiful book about the Lakota Sioux uh, shaman, holy leader. Anyway, Black what Elk. What book? Uh, Black Elk Speaks. John Neinhardt was a trans. Uh, he sat with Black Elk and lived with him and heard his stories. And Black Elk was present as a young boy at the Battle of Little Bighorn when they when they killed Custer and slaughtered all his men. And he was he was a contemporary of Crazy Horse and. Uh, Bunch other, I'm sorry, I have lack, lack of sleep. But um, I said to the teacher, I said, you know, I really love Black Elk because Black Elk says that my people's tradition is true. And I affirm that it's true. And if you look at the stories that we tell about Buffalo Woman, these are true stories. But I also look at the, the stories of uh, the, the Wazichus, the, the white men. Uh, and actually, you could be a Wazi Chu if you were a black person too, but just non-Indian. Um, and, and I see that they are true. When they talk about Christ, these are true. Black Elk could, he was a renaissance man. Like, he was, he was able to live with both languages and see the value of both languages without any condemnation or, 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 or all, all the pain he, he was able to, to see. And the woman, Don Hill, she said, oh, Black Elk was an Uncle Tom. The teacher, right? And then I quit. I quit that class. I took a course at the tribe of Socrates instead, sorry. <laughs> but uh, that was, to me, the problem was, you know, trying to find ways of building bridges. That's why I like to do, you know, you look at Lao Tzu, you look at Zhuang Tzu, you look at Madhyamaki, you look at... I like, I like to see those, diff and I like, moreover, to go back to ancient and medieval things, because I feel like we just, it's, my, my principal back home, he thinks nothing's any good unless it's for tomorrow. It's, it's, it's got to be the most modern stuff, and it, it has to be, everything has to be, everything old, it, it's outmoded, it's discarded. If you, if you care about that, you're going to be left behind. The kids should all be studying robotics, right? Uh, no, you know, they don't, they're not interested in having philosophy in, in my school, right? And what I say is that, Good. Is, that has always been the case. Yeah. It's nothing new. Yeah, it, you're, I think, I think you're, you're right. right. The, uh, yeah, the first philosophers in Greece, in ancient Greece, were in fact elitists. They, these, these guys were aristocrats. Yeah. There were very few of them. People who, like, took, they, they could become compared to today's millionaires. Oh, remember too, though, Robert, that yeah. Aristotle says all men seek, to, all human beings seek to know. He means, you know, all human beings are capable of philosophizing, and these traditions in this book are, well, I'm not, I'm not sorry, any of these traditions that are explored, you'll find that people say, this is, this is an activity that's fundamentally human. It's not an elite thing. Uh, right. Right? Right. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm a bit worried about it. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Maybe I have another question just I wanted to, uh, to say what I like from your lecture uh, uh, and appreciate it. Uh, it was that, for me, it was not abstract. It was like, in your thinking and uh, speaking was something which, in which I feel alive. Yes. And uh, because for me the most worst dis disaster or disease uh, in education is abstraction and yeah. intellectualization and yes. to be in ideas yes. and, and, uh, and I'm just thinking how did you do? Uh, how Yes, uh, like is there some relation between the land in your childhood? I think it was. And uh, was was you some uh, somewhere? Mm, some 
was in your last mm, a point when you was also pledged in abstractions or you are from the childhood like yeah uh, I, I hope that you uh, understand. I still honestly what's your name? Peter. 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 Uh, I mean, it's excellent, Peter. I mean, I still am, suffer from delusions. I, I still get things disordered, right? Um, abstractions, though, I was lucky, like, um, because I think I've always been, because of the grounding in, in nature and on a farm, I think that that made me suspicious in some ways of those things. But also, I was very lucky because when I went away to university and I was telling... Um, I was telling Susanna about this when we were on our train over here. Um, I had a really good professor. I just happened. It was a freakish thing. I had a really good professor, Stravko Planitz, a um, Croatian fellow, a wonderful, brilliant man. And he was so careful. That, that, was the, that was the big danger that he wanted us to know about. Um, he, he, you know, at times it was abstraction. At times it was the word ideology. Right? Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the dangers of this and how this has been the scourge of the 20th century. And then um, another fellow that I read, he's a Canadian philosopher. His name is George Grant. Have you ever heard of George Grant? Yes. In Canada, he's very famous, but I think probably outside of Canada, not so much. I don't think people have heard so much of him. There's so many people here in uh, Prague that um, uh, Susanna was telling me about that I know nothing about. But it's probably a very similar thing. Maybe it's another grant. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he has a short little essay called, what is it, Ide Ideology in Modern Empires. I think that's the name of it. And it's in a bigger book of essays. I can't remember. It's in honor of some guy that I've long forgotten his name. But it's, it's very good on abstraction, on the problem of abstraction, on the problems of ideology. I love George Grant. He's got some other excellent books, like um, he's got a book called Technology and Justice, and um, uh, what's the other one? Oh, there's, there's another one. I, my brain is, is crashing from lack of sleep, but um, he's, he's very much into, Peter, this idea that uh, technology is a kind of ideology. That there's a, there's, that it creates a certain abstract sense for us of our own power, uh, of our, of our it, it justifies to us what we do in the world. We often do things simply because we can Right, um, the power we have, it, 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 you know, it, you know, it's like Augustine with the libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. Right, um, that technology gives us. It, you know, it's like it's like in the Lord of the Rings. It's like the ring, you know, or it's like you know, Darth Vader going to the dark side. It's, it it has a kind of a uh, an allure to it that um, that we suffer from. So. That is actually a very interesting thing to me because all around us in education, technology is really a big thing back home in Canada, right? How do we incorporate more technology? The kids love technology, can't get them off their phones and stuff, so we may as well be harnessing, harnessing uh, their love of technology towards bigger pursuits. And uh, there's some merit to that, I think, but then uh, what are the underlying assumptions? And so there's some abstractions afoot there that I'm really interested in. Sounds like maybe you're interested in too in uh, investigating, right? And, and you said you know Eric Vogelin. Was that you that put your hand up? So Vogelin, oh my God, Vogelin. Anybody want to read anybody good? Read Eric Vogelin. But uh, he talks about uh, Gnosticism and something called pathology which is a big word. But um, I'm interested in the extent to which technology or instances of that, no, Eric Vogelin's critique of Gnosticism um, as a kind of self-salvation, right? As a way of uh, uh, transforming the world 
uh, to save ourselves, right? We don't. We we look to. We become our own gods, right? Through through um, through technology, and so that's. These are big abstractions. To me, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, that's that's the thing that interests me. Já myslím, že pro mě bylo strašně zajímavé, kdyby se každý řekl jenom třeba název naší diplomky, kdyby se mohli jako trošku prezentovat, jako, co se vůbec jako děje tady jako u nás, eh, budoucí doktoři filozofie na pedagogických fakultě, čím se zabývají. So, I was, uh, each of, of them a little bit present their thesis. OK? Yeah. For you. Oh, sure. <laughs> so, we will start. Behind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, um, before before talking about the, the dissertation thesis, uh, can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <This is laughs> sorry. It's a practical question. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm interested in your opinion on what's going on in Canada uh, concerning the new law about language. That, that language law. And the use of the words like Z and uh, O. Yes. Uh, can you talk about this? And, uh, like, What's your name? Dalibor. Dalibor. It's a Slavonic name, so yeah, like, Dalibor? call me Daniel. Daniel? <laughs> Is that okay? That's okay? <laughs> it's another <laughs> name. It's Daniel. Daniel, um, I don't have any great amount of expertise in that. I probably know as much as you do about it. I listen on the news. Um, about it, I've heard many of my colleagues at university levels uh, talk about it with very frustrate, much frustration and much consternation. Um, to me, it doesn't bug me. Um, I, I have lots of kids at the high school who identify this way or that way, and then one day identifies this way, and then the next day identifies this way, and then one day, this is my name, and then two weeks later, no, that's not my name, this is my name, and I just call people by what they want to be called. Uh, that's my attitude on it. I, I, I mean, uh, I've never had, I've never, I've never gotten in uh, any amount of trouble. I know some of the people who um, don't like it that I know who are professors, They've had um, encounters where um, you know, they've been accused of uh, not showing respect or whatever because they didn't know how to do it properly. So I think maybe maybe people have to be more patient with, you know, maybe on the one hand we have to try harder to make people feel comfortable being in a class. But then on the other hand, the people who want to, they have to be patient with older people who don't know exactly what, how to na navigate that space. But to me, that's, that's how I, I don't have any problem with it uh, at my school. It doesn't bug me. I'm just glad to be able to find out what they want to be called mm -hmm. and then be able to sit with them and talk. That's good. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, yeah that, that's fine. Thank you for your just for your opinion, I was interested in this. Because there, there was a, and there is an ongoing discussion here about, about this, and that not, uh, not that, I think we are okay with this, like to call people how they want to be called, yeah. that's fine. The, the, the problem or the discussion went uh, around the fact that government sort of like tries to prescribe us mm. the language uh, which we are like we are ordered to speak a language by government this yeah. is, but, so this was ridiculous or and maybe even you know not only ridiculous but dangerous maybe yeah, I can totally see your point I, I guess you know what I maybe because I've gone back to teaching high school I haven't yet grappled with um, the way that that pans out in a post-secondary institution like a university, uh, and I haven't, I haven't really encountered any of those problems. Like I haven't, nobody's breathing down my neck saying what I need, telling me, you know, enforcing 
language mm -hmm. in that way with, with me in my school. And I don't know of anyone in the school district that... I haven't heard anybody complain about that where I work. Um, but I have heard from professors. Mm -hmm. Right? So it, it, it sounds like to me it's... It, it sounds like it's a bigger distressing thing in universities, maybe, than it is in... Well, it hasn't really arrived here yet. No, <laughs> but it's coming, slowly. Yeah. What is it about, actually, uh, this Z? What are they going to prescribe? Uh, it's about, like, creating new, like, new genders in language. It's, uh, is it correct? Like, yeah. we have he or he and she, normally. Yeah. Like, perhaps it. Yeah. Well, or they. <laughs> often they, right? So yes. there's, there's, um, there are some, some kids in our school. I get so tripped up because I'm an English teacher and it bugs me. Like that, you know, because like I try to teach, okay, well, when you've got he, or when you, you don't, you know, they, he and they shouldn't be interchanged, but you have, this is the way that you have to do it now when you've got people who identify in both genders. It's they. I struggle with it, but I try my best. Yeah, I don't know. My wife is good at it. She she's uh, an Aboriginal success coach at our school, and um, Aboriginal people have a whole uh, cultural tradition. I can't remember the technical name for it, but it's like two spirited. There's a there's a native term for it, but two spirited just means you've got both genders inhabiting you at the same time. So. She's always, you know, there's kids in the school that are native kids uh, from Siksik or Tutana, Stony, uh, different native bands, and they, it's they. You know. uh, go see Keegan, uh, they want a pencil. They, you mean she? Oh, she? Okay, it's Keegan, it's no longer Cassie, it was Cassie, then it was Casey, now it's Keegan. And then it's gonna be something. Well, whatever, I don't care, I mean, you want to do it? Sure, let me get you a pencil. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and can I keep, can I, can, you know, the big thing is can I, can I help her feel comfortable? Because um, she is not comfortable in school, or he, they. Sorry, see, I'm, doing, I'm not even doing it right. They are not comfortable in school. Uh, they get panicky, they get attacks, they, 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 they cannot write a single. They're in grade 11 and they can't write a paragraph because they're so overwhelmed with all this stuff that's happened and it's and it's 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 um, generational neglect, like okay, from residential schools and yeah. So you know, I mean, even I mean, in the 80s when I had I had long hair, right? I did. Uh, uh, you know, I remember. You know, I was at a bar, and somebody tapped me in the back, a guy, and I turned around, and they thought it was a girl, because I guess I had a nice bum or something, and, and they turned, they're like, oh! <laughs> you know? Uh, or, 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 like, all the old rock bands from the 80s, they, you know, the men dressed as women, and they, they, there's very, a lot of gender fluidity for a long time. It's just, I don't think we really understood that that's what it was then. It, even back in ancient Greece, right, with the comedies, and it's, oh my gosh, people dressing up as women, women dressing up as men, uh, you know, uh, or carnival, right, Car carnival, uh, topsy-turviness, it's, it's all part of, it's, it's in a way, it's a spiritual invest, why not celebrate it? It's a spiritual investigation. Who am I? It's kids. Crying out from the heart. Who am I? I don't even know. I mean, it was simple for me. I was like, okay, I know what I am. But for, for many kids, it's not that simple. They, they're wanting to know who they are. Hey, that's a philosophic question. Like it's, it's actually pretty beautiful. So if you want me to call you they, I'll call you, or Z. Sure. Let's do that. Maybe I'm a Z. I don't know. That, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. So, so she wants. She still wants me to talk about. <laughs> you don't want to. <laughs> Just the title. Or... Titles. So, uh, 
Um, I, have, uh, I have a PhD in theology, oh. and I wrote a book on Emmanuel Levinas, the philosopher. Nice. And uh, now I'm here studying another PhD at uh, uh, like this faculty, and I'm wow. writing on Com Comenius, the, the book. No way! Yes, yes, yes. The, wow! So My so, hero. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's excellent, yeah. Wow. I'll have to read that someday. Yeah. <laughs> when the English translation comes out. Because I... It exists. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so my PhD thesis is on, well, like, called uh, American philosophy will focus on time, on the problem of time. So, namely, like, um, the guise of, uh, of classical pragmatism and processual philosophy, so Peirce, James, and Whitehead. Yeah. Uh, and I'm somehow trying to, like, um, develop field or try to open the field of discussion or for discussion uh, between um, American philosophy and continental philosophy because uh, I think that it's, it's the thing that's somehow la lacking here. Oh. And, uh, my motivation for it is that if we blame uh, pragmatism as sort of um, uh, thing that um, uh, caused what we are suffering now from, uh, we have to like research it and somehow think about it more, more deeply. Mm -hmm. And what, what I think is that the, the problem of time is somehow like overlapping uh, both kinds of philosophy. But it's it's nonsense to say to say it this way. Just, um, perspective from continental philosophy and American. I, it sounds that sounds really good. Um, it, uh, actually, when, when you started uh, writing about diamondiasis, it was the first thing that came to my mind that uh, you were talking very much about the pure experience of William James. So, just <laughs> well, there you go. That's good. I'm glad. I was gonna say, do you know this fellow, Mercy Ali? Yeah. 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 Uh, I can't remember if it's his book on yoga or his book on shaman. I think it's the yoga book. Uh, he talks about anxiety. Mm -hmm. And he says, where's all this anxiety come from? And he says, one of the reasons why we have anxiety is we have such a, an acute awareness of time. Uh, and we've become kind of focused on it, but... We have no corresponding or alternate or, I don't know what the right word is, contrasting awareness of eternity or timelessness. And so we become yeah. full of anxiety. And to me... Yeah, very much. Any time if you talk about time, you usually talk about death. Yeah! <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it usually ends. And you think about all the workplace and societal anxiety and sickness and people... Kick, kicking over because of the all the yes. and then the kids with with so many emotional problems and emptiness and these people leaving leaving home like in in Calgary we had a whole bunch of people leave and go over to fight in ISIS and it, like what it, it, you know in some ways I think maybe it's because we have such a focus on time but with eternity we're craving we we, we feel a lack we don't. We don't have a corresponding uh, ground. I, that yes, would be exactly it because you cannot uh, positively say anything about uh, eternity. Yeah, that, that, that's why it's so like troubling. <laughs> and if you are talking about time, we must talk about eternity as well. Yeah, in the other Well, we because talk about time all the time. Oh, there yeah, we are, exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but then, like, do you know? Do you remember Augustine in Confessions? Isn't it book ten or something? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he no, has that no, big no. long discussion on time. And okay, we all talk about time, but then he starts looking at it. It's like, whoa, this is amazing because you can't even you think you know what time is, you're always talking about it, but time is the past the past is over with, so it doesn't exist, the future doesn't exist, and the now is always moving, and it's like, what is it? And you can't even figure out what time is. Yeah, and afterwards it's, it's developed into the AB theory of McTaggart's that and actually the time doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a wow, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a wonderful it's, thing, it's, right? It's really, 
a perfect time is pretty much everything we have, if we can, if we can say it this way, because time, uh, in Heideggerian way, is saying so, it's being. Mm. And if you understand time as being, uh, in, in, in this point of view, we can like you know, talk about time uh, without any um, like cultural, colored mm. uh, talks. Mm. Okay, so, because we share it together because we are human, we mm. all are, and we are finite. Yes. And our finiteness is the way how we work with time. And, how, and time, as we call it, as James said it, uh, is pretty much abstraction of our living. Because uh, if I say the word time, it has to be abstraction, because it's somehow pointed to a certain like manifold of, of the universe. Mm -hmm. But if I live it, in a pure experience of Noesis, uh, it's some, something completely different, and it's intransible. Mm -hmm. That's the, the main clash, and that's the way how content philosophy of Husserlian and Heideggerian tradition, or even existentialism, uh, how it how the type works here, is pretty much the thing uh, as I see, and probably I might read it into it a little bit. Uh, in, in American philosophy, named it person James, mm. and then comes Whitehead with his metaphysical process, yes. which is kind of completely like different way how to how to understand it, or rather to say how to describe it. Michal and Ende, jak ten co napsal na na konci because Michal and Dad, so this uh, the author of Never Ending Story, oh. and uh, he uh, wrote another book about time, mm. and the title is Momo, Momo. and uh, uh, story time. Uh, it's storytelling, but it's about philosophy for children mm. and the time. Ah. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's similar to Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to Galaxy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading it with my son. <laughs> yeah, they're actually good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. It's a strange feeling that I have to say something, but the last time I have used my English was before two years in India, so that's the way my English skills are. So I can understand you. And, uh, so I, I don't like my thesis. I still think about it, and yeah. I have nothing. <laughs> I have to write about nothing about void. Oh, by a Czech philosopher Egon Bondy. So Ooh. I don't know how to say something about nothing. That's still the problem. But it's pretty much time eternity trouble as well. <laughs> wow, you um, picked off a big one there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. Yeah. So does the boy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have two interests. Uh, one, because I'm also a teacher in high school, mm. so uh, I'm trying with my colleague <laughs> to write uh, not about nothing, but uh, some kind of textbook that, that could be used uh, in the high school education. Because ah, uh, we have problem in the Czech education with the philosophy, with the educational philosophy that it's uh, teached in a very traditional way, like like how to learn where when what did the philosophers write and when did they live and uh, what did the school they belong to. Yes, but they don't think the thoughts. They just uh, it's it's based on a history of philosophy, but history of philosophy is not philosophy thinking. So yeah. we're trying to create, uh, pick, pick up the text and try to create something that can be used in the school and be based on the activity of the students. Like it's, uh, it's inspired from the construct, uh, constructivistic uh, uh, education. Yes. So this is one interest. And uh, the second is, uh, Problem of uh, otherness in philosophy. Like the problem the, of uh, otherness. Oh, okay. The other and uh, the intersubjectivity uh, yeah. from Husserl and Levinas. And stuff. Yeah. So this Popechka. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. so these two. Uh, well, that's exciting because you've got, you know, the big problem, but you're actually looking at how to make it live in a high school or live in yeah. a school with kids. That's exciting. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be really cool. When, when, you, when you get uh, thinking about that and you write something out, it'll be interesting to see how that pans out and if you can try it with kids. And, yeah. yeah.
I love I love being with kids, you know. Because uh, kids. It's a great situation when they open their minds, when they just uh, um, know that it's about them. It's not just abstract something, but but it's talking the text or talking to them like a ah. living person. So that's yeah. I agree that if you see that now, there's change of the way. That that's exactly what I love about it. Yes. <laughs> it's nice coming here. Yeah. Like, I don't know, you know, just feeling like, oh my gosh, I've got some people here that I can kind of feel an affinity with. It's really good. I'm glad that I'm here. Thank you. Yes, sir. At first, I'm sorry for my English. No, it's good. Because it's poor, but no, no. my thesis is about adult, or what uh, does it mean, adulthood, in philosophical perspective? means not biological, not by uh, uh, psychology or sociology, but uh, what's the essence of uh, adulthood? And Ad adulthood? Adult. Yeah, okay, that's, that's good, yeah. So I think there's a link between adult and uh, authenticity, and the adult is not only period in life, but I think it's a still actual duty. Every day uh, we are calling to be real adult, real yeah. human. Yeah. yeah. And what does that mean to be an adult? Yeah. yeah. That's that's a big topic. You know, I don't know. I haven't really. I mean, because Aristotle, he talks about the spudaios, the serious man, and for him, maturity is about being serious, right? That's why he's so. In some ways, he's critical of play. And he, he has kind of like pretty low opinions of kids because they're not serious and they're not capable of being serious. Um, then um, the other fellow that I like is Neil Postman. Neil Postman? Anybody, Neil? Neil Postman. Um, he's, uh, he's written some kind of famous books. Um, there's one he has on... Uh, it's called the end of childhood or something like that. Mm -hmm. or the, no, it's called the, this. This is it. How do I? Oh, pardon my spelling. Disappearance. Disappearance of childhood. Mm -hmm. So, the construction of childhood. What it means to be a child. Um, where our understanding of childhood comes from, as opposed to adults, and how. He relates it to um, literacy. Literacy is the dividing line for him. I like him. He's a big thinker on technology. Oh, his most famous one. Uh, I think it's called Amused to Death. Have you ever? No, oh, thank you. <laughs> Ro Roger Waters from Pink Floyd put a, a, an album out like 20 years ago called Amused to Death after reading uh, you know, Postman's book. Yeah, but that I, 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 it's fun. Like, there's all kinds of really neat facts in there. Like, whoa, I never knew that about children. The idea of children as being some kind of creation, like it, you know, of of of, of, of historical circumstance. I always thought it worked, you know. Cool. Yeah. My question is uh, uh, if. Uh, we can speak about Aristotle or Virtutes like adulthood. Because uh, I think there is a man in Latin, ver, uh, virtus uh, in Latin. It, it comes from there and it means, yeah, man. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, manliness or man. To or... behave like adult. Yeah. To, to be virtuous or to have arete. Yeah. And if it's connecting also uh, with I think your pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, because I think adult is about uh, full white uh, of humanity. And so it is. And. Uh, but I think it's not work. Uh, you can say about it, uh, I have it. Yeah. I have it done yesterday. Yeah. So today it's not for me, I have it done yesterday. I think nobody can say it 
truly every day. So it's still uh, yeah before us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Challenge. <laughs> well, never ending, never ending challenge. Yeah. Yeah, they, they taste us. That's the Greek word. Thank you very much. Searching. The topic of my thesis is uh, political philosophy of Judith Butler. Uh, I tried to uh, relate her uh, later thought uh, to the realist streams of contemporary feminist philosophy and you know the turn from the performativity and like all this discursive precondition of subjective identity to the notion that something is real or shared by people without specific identity like concepts of uh, like life of the life or precarious life which can be shared so uh, to do with I ident identity um, yeah, yeah and how this identity relates to uh, more collective subjectivity okay. interesting yeah I don't know um I don't know very much at all about any of that, unfortunately. That sounds like a good topic. Uh, there's a lot of right now anything um, exploring feminist issues is pretty pretty important. Uh, with all the horrible, crazy stuff going on in the States and and you know, the awakening of uh, people's consciousness to um, things that happen uh, to women quite regularly. So this is, that was, that's an excellent topic. Thank you. My name is Peter U, Peter U. And uh, the topic of my dissertation, what does this is, uh, let's say in short, uh, Waldorf, Waldorf education. Oh yeah. But not the the main topic is not pedagogy or like the methods of Waldorf education, but the philosophical roots yeah. and the background and uh, this uh, worldview of Waldorf education and uh, let's say the uh, view of life. Of the founder of the Waldorf education, Rudolf Steiner. Yes. And uh, the, my motivation, uh, I, what is my motivation? On the one hand, I'm a high school teacher and Waldorf school in Prague. Huh. But it's not so important. But uh, uh, the important thing I think here is that how I understand you and your ideas about education and what is Sophia and so on, and uh, as I understood uh, what Waldorf pedagogy is and what is is the ground. Yes. I think that in my view, the Waldorf pedagogy has is most close to this. Yes. But when I see your books, there is no Waldorf pedagogy, no Rudolf Steiner. Yeah. And this is not exception. This yeah. is the mo this is the like mm, normal. Yeah. Also in our countries and. Uh, yeah. And when somebody is speaking about all the pedagogy, that, so I think that is a little bit misunderstood or mm -hmm. simplificated or something. Somebody says Gnosticism and or something like that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It'd be interesting to see with what you learned yeah. from Eric Vogler. Yeah, I know. Looking alongside yeah. and seeing because what Steiner does. Yeah, this big, big question. I, yeah. I, but I cannot answer it. Sure, uh, I could. I could give you only some uh, ideas. The Eric Pegelin and his books in our country are published in uh, Centrum for, for Democracy and Culture. It's, it's and is let's say a Christian or let's say Catholic publisher. Yeah. And uh, I think that 
his view is a little bit distorted by this view and his attitude to Gnosticism is not fair. Mm. I read it. Yeah. I think that there is some some background behind this and he see the Gnosticism like like theological, theological the point theological of view theory. yeah from the Catholic Middle Age point of yeah. view and yeah. so on. And I think because of this uh, I think that he he would uh, refused the world of pedagogy, but oh, I think he would too. But he said, you know, I, I agree, and I, I like I like what Eric Vogelin does on Gnosticism. I've learned an awful lot, and I think it's a very important way to look at the world. But I, even like with Nietzsche, I love Nietzsche. Like Plato's my my love, and then after Plato's probably Nietzsche. But he he had, you know, for Vogelin, Nietzsche's a Gnostic too, right? So mm. I I know, and you know, I I I'm not a Waldorf teacher. Uh, but I, I I went and visited. They're so it's it's so good. I, I I've observed a few times in Canada in Calgary. We have a Waldorf school and so interesting and 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 rich and the way that they teach kids. Like I was I was I was so amazed at the kind of work you guys do in the Waldorf school. So that's the thing, right? Like even if even if it was Gnostic, it it's beautiful. It's beautiful and. You know the foundational texts and and uh, you know that the earthiness of it too, right? The way that they are careful about keeping the tech out until later grades in Canada. Anyway, I don't know if it's probably the same here, right? Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, a lot of more hands-on learning, uh, you know, crafts, uh, construction of things with wood and yarn and <sighs> oh, just. Final words that uh, you see that um, there is a little bit disconnection between the, between this, let's say, acad academian world yeah. and world of world of pedagogy. There yeah. are people, teachers who are not too much like from academies, mm. and in academies there are not people who know too much about world of pedagogy, and yeah. it's disconnected. And I am trying to find some like uh, connection, connection or yes or. Or to find what is the relation of other pedagogy to this uh, Czech, like let's say phenomenological tradition, yeah. or what is the connection to Heidegger? Yeah. Because in uh, Rudolf Steiner works, works there is too much new ideas be, uh, similar to Heidegger, but before Heidegger, mm -hmm. there is too much ideas similar to let's say Thomas Kuhn, but before Thomas before, Kuhn. Yeah. And uh, but no, but in fact philosophies book of Western philosophies in the re regis register, yeah. there is no Rudolf Steiner. Yeah. So it's On my work. That it's sounds good. It's going to be good, right? I mean, that's, that's you found a, an area that, that needs exploration. It is something. Yeah, so it's going it's to make a big significant contribution. Yeah. Hello, my name is Jan. I just started to teach uh, philosophy of education, so I'm I'm living uh, in those topics, uh, wisdom seeking education, or uh, I see education as uh, I think uh, the sense of education is to turn to turn about. Yes, I can find it in Plato, in Augustine, yeah. and in other great thinkers. Yes. And I think that is our tradition, a Greek philosophy, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, my te my thesis, uh, I'm writing about Levinas on oh. freedom. Oh yeah. So and I think uh, his view of freedom is uh, quite original because. Uh, he sees freedom in relationship to others mm -hmm. and uh, I would say that freedom would be on your left side with Dianoia uh -huh. in his thinking and because he connect freedom with, uh, with uh, this uh, need to understand mm -hmm. in the meaning to grasp things, mm -hmm. to catch things uh, to have power mm. of things mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. 
but he says that the responsibility precedes a freedom. That's something that sounds strange, but uh, he says that the only human freedom is limited freedom, freedom of nature, adult, a uh, man that is responsible for others. Mm. And, I, and this is the right side, uh, theoria side, nice. or uh, ethics in his view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Valentina. Uh, I'm a first year student of PhD at the beginning of my learning. Um, as the title of my dissertation is the political philosophy of Hannah Arendt, oh. uh, but uh, now with my scientific advice we think about the strict name uh, because uh, I'm interested not only uh, political philosophy of Hannah Arendt but also um, uh, the formation of political and civic culture um, mm. uh, at the universities. Um, in the lessons of law and social sciences because I'm teacher of law and social sciences ah. and uh, I worked as a teacher of law in my town in the Russian Federation. Oh, Russia. really? Wow. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's a question of individualism and collectivism, actually, in my opinion. Adulthood, maybe adulthood. Yeah, the boy. <laughs> Let's say something about your work with children. Uh, well, on my work with children. No, so young people, but well, young men. I, I teach, but uh, that's not that's not what I was supposed. To, that's not what I'm supposed to talk about. I'm supposed to talk about my PhD. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, I teach music lessons. Um, oh, nice. And, uh, and I also teach philosophy oh. partly. And uh, yeah, those three, those two, those two subjects. Yes, and uh, I did English lessons in the past too. Yes. So, you're all very unusual. And you're very um, unusual people. <laughs> like, just all the stuff that you're up to and interested in. It's like, oh my god, it's so nice. Really, to know that people exist who think about these things. Yeah, and every, every first Thursday it's here. Yeah? The session. Oh, what, like all you guys on... On this. I hope. <laughs> every yeah. Thursday? First Thursday in first month. First Thursday in month. Wow. Every month. So, yeah, yeah. It's like well, you were talking about uh, Maritan's wife and we were talking about the salons. And <laughs> it's like that, eh? You get together. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, but, minus uh, the wine or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. sorry yeah, my, my dissertation topic is uh, Dostoevsky, which I've been doing research into uh, all my life almost. Yeah, I love Dostoevsky. For 50 years now. Yeah. And uh, in relation to the death of God theology. Oh. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Well, that's that's exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. What theology? Sorry. Uh, death of God theology. Death of God theology. <laughs> it's kind of a weird. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's sure nice meeting everyone. I'm feeling kind of fried though. I gotta say. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. I'd like, I, you know, I owe you an apology. Oh, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. What are you I, doing? When I compared you to a monk, that was... No, I, honestly, I, I was yeah, I was fine with it. I only did that because I, I, was, I couldn't find the right word. No, it's, it's fine. Only, it's only... Um, I no, I, I was... And I, and I said, <laughs> oh, I'm not even going to be offended. I, yeah. I'm not, I actually. Yeah, I wish I would. No, I don't wish I have family, but... Yeah. I mean, in, in some ways, uh, I think there is something kind of like about the monastic traditions yes. that I really, I really admire. So it's, it's like a kind of a compliment. That's what I was trying to say. It didn't come up. Neither one of us can speak English very well. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> Maybe your English is better. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe a mystic could have been. That's a better yeah. word. Than, I didn't want to use the word monk, sorry. But you're all, it sounds to me like you're all, like, I, Developing expertise in things, I, I, I mean, I don't know. That's, you know a lot about the things that you're interested in, you're learning about it, and that's, that's what education is for, I think. But, but uh, my question is now, uh, uh, which faculty uh, uh, were you studied before uh, this faculty? Could you say, because I think uh, not all are uh, here, from the Faculty of Education. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, my first the university attempt was the uh, Faculty of Humanities, uh, mm -hmm. one and a half year, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, then afterwards, I went to Protestant Theology Faculty, mm -hmm. oh. and then Assize Theology Faculty. As, as, so yes, interesting. So, so theological, uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. See, back home they'd say, "Why don't you go to welding?" <laughs> that's what they would say back home. I, I, I like what you've done. I think that's excellent. The melding of humanities and theology, right? And it takes you in. And then you guys are in it. It's so interesting to me. Like, my background, I did religious studies and religion and politics, and I was doing political theory and plus and education. And you guys are doing very. It's weird to meet people who are interested in kind of like the same mishmash of things that back home make you look like I have three heads. Like it's, it's kind of neat to, to meet people that have taken very similar interests and I like that. Yeah. It's good. It's from the theological uh, yes, I studied theology. Oh. And, uh, theology and philosophy and pedagogics at the same 
faculty at, at theological faculty. So that's the way I came to nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I also studied humanities before by my colleagues. So. Yeah. Yeah, I got fired after a year and a half, so... <laughs> <laughs> I finished it fast. I studied four years. Yeah, that's what I said. Technical <laughs> university. Right! <laughs> <Hey! laughs> and then a Faculty of Arts, uh, but education there. Oh, interesting, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, what's... It? There's a book uh, I read a few years ago. What's it called? Uh, uh, it's about motorcycles. It's not Zen and the Art. It was... Oh, shot. Shop class is Soulcraft. You heard, heard of that one? Shop, I can't remember the fellow's name now. Shop class as Soulcraft. And he comes at, he, you know, at um, the big ideas, um, at philosophy, uh, from the standpoint of someone in the trades who is interested in fixing engines and motorbikes and stuff. And this is a way of drawing kids into the bigger, deeper yeah. questions. It makes me wish that on the farm I had to follow my dad and my cousins as people who know how to fix stuff. I was too busy looking and gazing at the corn. <laughs> I wasn't learning any skills. <laughs> so you've got the skills and now you've got the chops to investigate the big zetetic questions. So that's good. Yeah. What about you, sir? Well, I studied philosophy. I didn't study into here in Czech Republic, but I'm from Slovakia, so I studied there in Trnava, in Trnavska University, Trnava University or University of Trnava cities, and the political science. And that, that, and that uh, in this place I met uh, one teacher who teach a lot about uh, Eric Fagelin. Oh. And uh, but it was not good school. No. Only he was a little bit like living, the yeah. other ones were too much in abstraction, yeah. and theoretical background and yeah. all this theory of, of uh, voting, voting systems and yeah. uh, okay, but uh, it didn't influence me too much, my, I influenced myself through self-education. Like, yeah. uh, self-education. Was it uh, the Faculty of Education? Or? No, it was like uh, mm, a philosophical Faculty, faculty of, of or Humanities or something. Yeah. Did you ever read, um, what's his name, Louis Lemour? You know that guy? Louis Lemour? No. He's most famous for cowboy westerns and stuff, writing, but uh, there's a thing that was published, a book of his published posthumously, so after he died, it was, I think it's called Education uh, of a Wandering Man, and it's, you know how you were saying, oh, I'm kind of self-educated? Louis Lemur is the epitome of a self-educated man, like, uh, when he was a young guy, he... He went out into the Great Plains and he, he visited with some of the last remaining soldiers from the Indian Wars who were out slaughtering, slaughtering native people. And he, he, he lived with those old men for a bit. And then he was a bindle stiff, you know, like the, the, during uh, the Great Depression, the guys who, they jump on the cars, the box cars, and went across back and forth working as a migrant worker and then he was like a boxer and he was and he went on a merchant marine and he was off in the war and he went over to like I don't know somewhere in the uh, Pacific uh, theater right and uh, he's done he's done he's done everything and every year of his life he kept a list of all the books that he read he read like a hundred books every year and He's like an example, and this, I, I mean, I've never read his cowboy stuff, I'm not really interested in that, but this book is so interesting, it's, it's just about how to become educated, self-educated, right? And he's very earthy, like he's not a man of abstraction at all, right? He will cut through all abstraction when you read him that. And I like him because he's, he writes journalistically, like kind of like uh, in aphorisms, you know, like Nietzsche, he's nice and 
you can pick it up, you can put it down. You can feel like he wrote it when he was like bumping down the trail or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. I studied history and philosophy to be a teacher at the hospital faculty of faculty of arms and letters in in Slovakia at Catholic University. Yeah. And then came here to do a PhD. Nice. And uh, I think I owe the answer to my colleague. <laughs> it's me. Yeah. Everybody's answering you. Yeah. I think philosophy can give you certainty, the sense of life. And I can't say to my students, I will. I can't find the sense of life instead of them. But I think uh, philosophy can teach us uh, uh, how to help with this ignorance in our life and, uh, and I think it's quite enough to start to think and to uh, start to problemize myself be self-critic. I think it's quite a lot today yeah. to start with the, that things are not as before they are. Mm. I think it's quite a good job that philosophy can do. But it's also uh, an extremely dangerous job. Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, and also, how do you define ignorance? But why is danger? No, <laughs> we have responsibilities. On that. <laughs> and how, how do you? How, the thing is, what is ignorance? I mean, who gives you the arrogance, really, I'm sorry, I don't take it personal, to define people as ignorant. I mean, that sounds pretty aristocratic to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, just coming to realize you yourself, like, I don't think Saki's going around, hey, you're ignorant, but it's more um, the you, through discussion with him, or through even discussions with yourself, you come to realize that you didn't know the thing that you thought you knew. It, I don't know if that's necessarily... Yeah, it could be. Uh, right. What's it? Hubristic or... Mm. Right? It's just more like a realization about yourself. And and then the idea behind uh, zetasis is... Or, or realization of ignorance is that actually it's supposed to inspire a kind of joy. Like, God, thank you that I realized that about myself. Now I can be... Now that... Like my in high school, well, not anywhere. You, you can't learn anything if you think you already know everything. Mm -hmm. And so the the learning begins when you become rec you recognize that you don't know. Um, so, yeah, I think philosophy. That's what. You know, actually, uh, what William James says when he talks to teachers, uh, he says you are here to point out what the children don't see. That by pointing out something out of the context, you're you're put the thing in uh, in their face or like in front of them in order to encounter it, in order to oh, yeah, get yeah. to know it. Yeah, that's what he said there. It's an interesting. Point. <clears throat> so yes, it's pretty much the, the thing. What he what what uh, uh, what he said. Yeah. yeah. So and there is one more important thing mm -hmm. that. Uh, men like Plato and Augustine and other teach us that we can't uh, live with just for ourselves. We have to go out yeah. and teach yeah. as good as we know. I think this uh, feeling of responsibility mm -hmm. to others is something present in all important thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's uh, this thing uh, is human, it's not something only Christian or only Buddhist or yes. only uh, Greek, it's, it's human. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we m miss responsibility at schools today mm -hmm. uh, because we don't give almost any responsibility to young uh, people mm -hmm. until they are 26 mm -hmm. and finish university yeah. and find some job and uh, I think that's the challenge of education uh, how to provoke them to 
do something for their colleagues, for example, at school. Yeah, it could be small. It could be small, but something. Um, I'm studying uh, at the North Caucasus Federal University uh, in, in the Russian Federation uh, in the Faculty of Law. Oh, wow. So we have a Oh, is it a law degree then? Like, uh, um, wow. Yeah, I'm a lawyer um, and That's five years in the Faculty of Law, like as a specialist, mm -hmm. and two years uh, in the master's program. So, oh. Um, with the law degree, you could be making big money being a lawyer, but you've chosen to not I, no, be poverty I, I, like soccer I, I can't. I can't talk as a lawyer because I'm. I'm teacher. It's my essence. And, um, but you, it's your essence. So yeah, I get you. I understand that. But it's interesting to me because lots of people would say, "My gosh, a I like to communicate with my students, um, with my pupils, and." Uh, it's pleasure. Yeah, well, the, yeah. You do it and you love it, and it's a passion, and the passion that you have will in turn ignite your students. And you're doing some. I, it's funny, when I was in the teaching program doing my Bachelor of Education as a teacher, uh, there were a number of people who had law degrees already, and they were like, I've been in law, I've been practicing law, uh, but it's made, I'm unhappy. And they wanted to be with students. And they, they know that that's where their, uh -huh. where their passion is, right? Because of that active component you were talking about, right? Like, you know, serving, serving others and, and um, how important that is in philosophy, the life of the philosopher, right? Active and contemplative. Yeah. But Ministry of Education uh, share needs uh, students of uh, faculty of law. So <laughs> <laughs> it's also a good choice for you. <laughs> Yeah, I studied humanities and political science. Nice. Mm -hmm. Here in Prague. Yes, in Prague. Mm -hmm. But let me just, again, <laughs> add something to my colleague. Because, uh, yeah, my point is uh, um, <laughs> just this practical uh, phrases uh, ratio is just about that to tell those people engaging in this mode that th their interests are not final, that you are part of a greater whole. Yeah. This is the notion. Where is the whole? I mean, the, uh, that whole needs to be created socially, uh, not only transcendently. Yeah, I guess it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be created. Uh-huh, it is. Oh, yeah. There's a problem. Yeah, it it is. Is. Well, <laughs> then if you can talk about being as existent, then no. I think we're being hypocritical. I think <laughs> because if I understand it right, he, he was just talking about being. And you're talking about some kind of existence, which is metaphysical, which is something like a little bit less than speaking of ontology of something that comes from that comes from being. If I got it right, I might be wrong. But... I I know, I know. <laughs> My point is uh -huh. uh, what uh, this uh, mode offers uh -huh. us is that you are that there is always a greater horizon. Mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. you, uh, you are part of greater whole, which uh, um, if it is transcendental or mystical, yes, well, it is, uh, but it goes well with Patochka's third existential movement, mm. doesn't it? Yes. I think so, it's uh, something where you, it's not explicit, yes, but, but it in exists. capitalism, in all, in the regime under which we live at the moment, mm -hmm. under which we're forced to live, um, it's, it's sometimes reduced to individualist uh, joy, uh, fun, exercise, do some meditation. Right. You know, why don't you do something spiritual? And in my opinion, that's a lie. It's mm -hmm. not enough. It's not the spiritual in its own original form as it should be. Mm -hmm. And the ideal for me would be massa period, for example. Mm -hmm. That's where or uh, Russian communism too. But I know it went ter 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 terribly wrong. But at, we, at least it was a gr one of the greatest attempts to build something work, uh, like uh, what I'm talking about right now. But I, the world we're living in at the moment has nothing to, to do with responsibility for others or serving others, as you said. That's a lie. The world can't take responsibility. I'm the only person That's that right. can be responsible for, to, some, to other and yeah. for something. Uh, 
sounds like collectivism or something like that, some ideal good society, but nothing like that never ever existed. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah it's uh, when we read, for example, Yanamo's comments, uh, Comenius, he shares this uh, idea that I need to uh, follow something more than just my personal or uh, interest or interest of my group and my nation yes. or my uh, some other uh, does the community. System, does the system allow everyone to do that? There are about three million people living in poverty in this country. That, by the way, just for you, that's one third of the of, the, of our population. Wow. Yes. Check I mean, does it. everyone have access to being awakened? If not, then it's 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 a, it's a hoax. So <laughs> if you borrow money for your TV or car, you can't afford that. Well, I don't want to get into I don't want to get into that debate because. We have never had such a yeah, good comfort are as we have today. It's three billion people. <laughs> okay, your point is that mm -hmm. we should... I agree with the point mm -hmm. that we should focus on concrete reality first. Concrete. And that's always been the case. Oh, well, okay. Uh, uh, all I'm saying is that religion has become a club fun activity <laughs> for individuals to do on their own in their living room, on their Zen sofas or the Zen cushions. <laughs> <It's> and <that's, laughs> it's, there is dialectics. It's, it's a dialectical process. Mm -hmm. These both, as in Patochka's uh -huh. first movement, it is anchorment harboring in the uh -huh. concrete reality. Mm -hmm. I agree with you on this point. We should focus on this practical. But then uh -huh. just let it open. Let it uh -huh. to perhaps at some point mm -hmm. to, to greater all, which somehow you can feel. It's a dialectical process for me. There is, and you have a good point. If mm -hmm. it is possible for all people, well, yes. Uh, I, I am not sure if I can answer this, but all people should or could at be at least aware that what they are doing um, is not a final, yeah. co final way of life. Yes, yeah. that's maybe part of the point. That. Uh, how can you educate someone who has got nowhere to live? That's, that's right, I agree with you. Well, it's it. not uh, teachable. Uh, yeah. we, it, what teachable? <laughs> focus on your concrete reality. Yeah. But uh, maybe let it open for some questions. Yeah. Okay. Susanna and I were talking about that on the way in. Like, I mean, right now, my students at the high school, they're refugee kids, mm -hmm. most of them from Syria, and lots of kids first, like, first couple of weeks into, into Canada, um, and they come from all terrible backgrounds, and you can't, you can't get at the matter of uh, what we consider education, like, you know, skills and knowledge and these things when the kids are so traumatized, mm -hmm. right? And like you say, if, if a kid is so hungry or doesn't have a wor where to live, it's it's a fool's errand to to uh, expect anything for those things. Right? You know, I mean, I think I agree with you on, on that. Uh, but once you can get beyond that, some of the things that they do crave is this connection, right? Like, I mean, I think that uh, if if you can help the kid feel safe, where before they were traumatized, help feed them, right? Give them a place where. You know, there's love, right? Mm -hmm. Then, uh, they become open to learning in a philosophic way, too. I, 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 I firmly believe that. I, I think that, you know, uh, they're capable of great wonder, like wondering. They're capable of perplexity. Uh, they do want to know. They have all the building blocks that Aristotle talks about for for philosophy, but, you know, when your stomach is, you know, your ruler, right, or when your fears are your ruler, or when you're angry, I have one boy in my class, uh, every day he blows up mm -hmm. from Syria, right, his, his family, horrible things happen, mm -hmm. every single day there's a, he has a blast of anger, destroys something, or smashes something. You know, it's it's anger is the dog that won't let go of him, and he, you know, how, that's what he has. Before he can learn other things, he needs to he needs to learn how to deal with that. Yeah. 
and that can be applied to adults too, not just children. Absolutely. So, like my biggest struggle even as someone who deigns to love wisdom, not to be wise, but to love wisdom, is mm -hmm. my own deficiencies of character. Uh -huh. I have anger. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I'm an angry person. I don't maybe look like I'm angry, but I get angry. Mm -hmm. Not as a teacher, uh -huh. but when I'm done teaching, I sometimes have a short fuse with mm -hmm. my kids or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. I can be a real jerk. Uh, you know, I also have a certain amount of arrogance. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done X, Y, and Z, and I can I can get proud of myself. Right? I have fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I have desires. You know, all these things affect my ability to love wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so that's the whole art of dying, too, right? Like when you're practicing, uh, that's why I love teaching, too, because it's such a good opportunity every day to be in service to your neighbor. So I can practice love of wisdom by dying to my own ego. You know, kids do something that makes my ego twinge, but I have the power of this teacher hat, this, this, this persona that I have been imbued with by the state that gives me a, a, a weird magical control over myself. Not like when I get home, I don't. I, I, I sometimes let loose ignorantly and shamefully. But when I'm a teacher, I have a kind of a control over myself. The, the things slide off my back easier, I, and I feel less egotistical. Less. I feel like teaching and the love of wisdom is the art of dying, kind of like. That's why I love teaching. I don't think I could ever give it up, right? Maybe, maybe that, because like, maybe that's why you love being with kid, students too, you know? It's kind of magical that teaching is like that. I, don't, I think we're really blessed that way. Like, I think a lot of other professions, they don't get to have that. Like you with music, right? Mm. You guys have really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. So, uh, tomorrow.